in these challenging times when the world is slowly recovering from the pandemic we are reminded of a sobering fact nelson mandela rightly said the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling but in rising every time we fall we got to experience that fall in the last two years when the pandemic struck the whole world it gave a tough time to the individuals and the businesses suffered losses to a large extent it was an unprecedented situation for the supply chains and operations of most of the companies massive disruptions were seen over all the industries but businesses are getting back on their feet constantly emphasizing on making their supply chains robust again to prevent losses from any such mishaps in the future we are seeing companies resorting to more and more technological solutions to become more efficient thus giving rise to intelligent supply chains worldwide the ninth global supply chain management conference offers a number of exciting opportunities for academics and practitioners with multidisciplinary interests it gives them a chance to interact and explore research opportunities curricular innovations and their delivery to seek partnerships between academia and practice communities dealing with all aspects of business that overlap with the supply chain and technology management the purpose of this conference is to investigate various aspects of these complexities and explore competitive strategies across the global business landscape ages sumaya institute of management has invited students and researchers from across the globe to submit their research papers for the conference the best of which will be presented in the afternoon session of the conference along with this we also received articles from around the world for the international edition of our quarterly magazine momentum december 2021 edition not just this a case study competition and a simulation game competition were conducted leading up to this conference which saw participations from the most esteemed institutions across the nation we would now like to invite our honorable director dr monica khanna for the inaugural address dr monica khanna has completed her electrical engineering from national institute of technology warangal mms from nmims and phd from university of pune she has been associated with kj sumaya institute of management for over 25 years and her academic experience spans the area of marketing strategic brand management and market research she has been a visiting faculty at iit bombay shailesh jay mehta school of management niti mumbai dhpw stuttgart germany and institute of industrial management economics and trade st petersburg polytechnic university russia she has successfully guided three doctoral candidates from university of mumbai and bit mesra ranchi she also has an industry experience of over 4 years in engineering and industrial automation with siemens limited at mumbai we request dr monica khanna to address the audience gathered here to kick start the event as always it is wonderful to have you amongst us ma'am the stage is all yours okay thank you very much uh, very warm welcome to all of you and i'm really happy to be uh, once again to be part of the uh, global supply chain management conference um i'm happy to see so many delegates and uh, all the students uh, who have gathered here today for this conference uh, the theme for this conference being intelligent supply chain i think that's the very very apt uh, theme today everything is become flexible and everything has become fluid uh, the manner in which the technology has evolved over uh, the la- especially over the last uh, i think 5 years and uh, more so the focus uh, uh, has been on the technology in the covid era that is in just uh, in the past 2 years i think uh, it's very important that technology is completely woven into the uh, supply chain so whether we are providing a service or whether we are providing a, a product Uh, and whether we are providing a service or a product all mixed together i think it's very important to uh, have a very intelligent supply chain which is completely you know led by uh, automation and it is led by uh, by machine learning and various other technologies that are there so the intelligent supply chain being a marketing person i think it is number one the entire supply chain will be pulled by the consumer and uh, the amount of freedom and flexibility that the consumer needs or the consumer is expressing i think that is something that the supply chain has to fulfill and the entire value chain has to move along with it today if you just see the manner in which we buy insurance policies or the manner in which we even buy uh, let's say products like uh, you know all our household items or even if we buy 
luxury products or whether we buy cars or bikes or scooters everything it may be online it may be offline but somewhere we have to keep the consumer in the center so the entire intelligence supply chain has to keep the uh, consumer in the center and what are the needs and the requirements of the consumer today the entire supply chain also is becoming very very uh, complicated because there are other agents which are coming in and which are giving you alternate uh, channels of uh, distribution so the amount of choices that the consumer has is completely unbelievable and the entire supply chain has to uh, move accordingly i mean uh, some of the things uh, that i think of is that when we are designing our supply chain we have to think of what is our core product and what is the supplementary product or service uh, that we are uh, providing uh, or, or in the past few days i was just uh, seeing the front page advertisement uh, of lenovo and uh, on some days they were advertising for lenovo and on the other on the other days they were ad actually advertising for lenovo services and on one day they were actually uh, advertising along with the intel the uh, that is the co branding uh, the ingredient brand for the uh, lenovo laptops and its uh, products so you can just imagine how much of uh, focus is coming in it's not just about selling the product but it's also about selling the uh the complementary service uh, along with it and uh, the the service aspect according to me for any product is becoming even more important as a country you must be we are daily interacting with the various supply chains like for example let's say the supply chain for the milk you know early morning at 6 o'clock you have milk at home early morning uh, at 6 o'clock you have the newspaper at home so this is a 24 by 7 supply chain that's working and uh, for us this is no strange uh, aspect uh, but today this entire concept of 24 by 7 supply chain it has been thrown open to all products and services as far as the education industry is concerned we can see the manner in which the entire value chain or the supply chain has changed because we can uh, study any product any any aspect that i want whether it is a subject or whether it's for reskilling or things like that and it is on the anywhere anytime mode so companies like cosera companies like upgrad and all and companies like byju's the type of services that they're providing us the entire concept uh, of supply chain and giving value to the customer has completely changed so this is applicable not just for products but i think in every aspect of our life today and uh, all of us today i think the supply chain further is going to become led because of the smartphones that we have because of the smartphones that we have and the accessibility to the internet that we have through our mobile phones i think that will further enhance uh, the requirement and the concept of an in, uh, intelligent supply chain so i mean there are various aspects and there are various uh, facets to intelligent supply chain another aspect that uh, seems to be very contemporary today and that is called about the green supply chain so it's not just about supply chain it's not just about intelligent supply chain but it's also about uh, sustainability and it's about uh, you know uh, giving a, a very a good solution to our consumer without even without harming the planet because these are the things that are today becoming uh, at the forefront and uh, thanks to the uh, covid i think a lot of awareness about such aspects have come in the minds of the uh, consumers have evolved and they these are becoming base expectations for them so whether it's an intelligent supply chain whether it's a green supply chain or whether it's a circular economy i think these things are something which most of us seem to have you know it may have been in somewhere in the periphery of our mind but today all these things have become mainstream so i would like to uh, congratulate the organizers for number one thinking of this theme and getting the type of research papers that you have got and the type of uh, uh, speakers that you have got for this conference i wish you all the very best and i wish you a whole day of happy learning uh, debating and discussions so thank you and uh, welcome to all of you and uh, this is my small take i'm not a supply chain expert but uh, i definitely am a engineer i and i started my career with siemens so and and i was doing automation projects at that time so i do have a sense of all these things and i think today it's really become center stage so from the periphery it has all become center stage and whether it is in the education industry whether it's in consumer durables fmcg you can see these these changes happening everywhere
and uh, all the changes will definitely it is led by marketing but i think at the end of the day the delivery is coming from the supply chain so we are all closely linked with each other and technology is the backbone for all these activities so good luck to all of you and uh, it's really wonderful uh, to have all of you here today with us thank you so much and i hope you have more and more such debates and discussions these are the order of the day thank, thank you ma'am so for much. sharing such insightful words with all of us after those encouraging words from our director dr monica khanna let us now proceed with the keynote speech we feel privileged to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker for today's event mr rohit bhat mr rohit currently holds the position of the vice president of supply chain operations at resilink is a leading cloud provider of supply chain resilience and risk management intelligence and analytics solutions industry leaders like amgen gm and emc rely on resilink to mitigate risks end to end while achieving long term competitive advantage and building brand and shareholder value mr rohit has over 18 years of experience in operations and management and has worked with resilink for 6 years analyzing and evaluating operational needs and creating strategies to improve productivity enhance quality and improve cost effectiveness he is an expert on supply chain risk with years of experience in the business world to back it up We are so delighted to have you among us today, sir, and we request you to kindly share your thoughts with the audience. Okay. Thank you, uh, and good morning to everyone. Um, I'd like to first start off by thanking uh, the organizing committee um, and KJ Sumaya Institute of Management for giving me this opportunity um, to address. um in this keynote conference um as i'll get started i'll try to first share um i'd like to share something uh um if that is okay yes sir please go ahead sir um i think it's disabled uh i'll just we'll just give you the sharing right just a second Yes, sir. You can go ahead, sir. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Just take a quick minute. Um. Uh, my screen coming up. Okay. Yes, sir. We can see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you see uh, the document or uh, 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 we can see the presentation? Okay. Yeah. All right. So so let's get right on it. Um, um, supply chain has been in the news. Um, some would um, argue the supply chain is the news um, currently. But uh, if you look. Uh, at supply chain in particular supply chains has been around for centuries right if you look at uh, uh, from right from the medieval times uh, to olden ages from the architecture to 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 the clothing that the trade routes that we had humanity has relied on supply chains uh, to enrich their life um, it's therefore also fair to say that that, that supply chain risk has also uh, have been humanity's all this living problem um i start off with with the small little uh point right uh, i'm sure every one of uh, of us have uh, at some point or the other uh seen or heard this poem when i was uh, um in early school my teacher had given me her interpretation of this poem right um for want of a nail a shoe was lost something on the line surf a stitch in time saves saves line uh, many eminent personalities um have used this in uh, in their literary works um i have my own interpretation of this for me as a supply chain professional looking uh you know being in the industry looking at how uh, the last few years have unfolded 
I think this poem is very apt. Uh, my interpretation of this um, is essentially uh, 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 and the earliest documented case of a multi-tier supply chain disruption. Um, uh, from emanating from someone who's at, at, at a tier four or a tier five supplier supplying a nail uh, to his customer who's required to service the horse, who's required to, to, to ensure that, that the horse is available for, for his customer um, to go into battle. Eventually, um, a lot of these, uh, these knights, these companies could not really um, make it to battle, probably because any, everyone were, were relying on this fourth tier supplier to supply the nail to, to his equipment and the battle being lost. The anecdote here being, um, the analogy here being the customer, uh, you lose your customer, you lose your reputation and so on and so forth. So, Multi-tier supply chain risk is the oldest problem um, that humanity has faced, and, and uh, we see that it continues. Um, if you need any further proof, um, you know, here are some data points um, you know, that you have. Um, some background into this data set. We, uh, this data comes from uh, ResLink EventWatch um, AI. Right, uh, Event Watch AI is one of the most comprehensive uh, supply chain uh, um, disruption monitoring and reporting services. Um, the data from from Event Watch AI and the trends year on year say that supply chain uh, disruptions, it's not only started with the pandemic; it's it's been uh, it's predated um, the pandemic. Uh, if you see some of the charts. Some uh, a, a big long line right in the middle uh, points to the human health. Those are the news and events that we cover as part of uh, uh, the human health or the pandemic related disruptions that we observe globally, uh, starting with the first one in in uh, in, in January fourth uh, uh, when when we uh, reported um, uh, a pneumonia like virus uh, in Wuhan, but. Um, startling, as you see, is the factory fires, right? They have been rising, they have always been high, uh, but what is startling is the number of factory fires that have uh, been occurring in the last one year um, alone. In the last six years, uh, six months, I'm sorry, uh, we've reported almost 863 cases of factory fires. Some of these, um, have our have a relation to to pandemic or the COVID induced lockdowns and employee restrictions in work in in workplaces and factory floors. A lot of companies uh, had to limit the number of uh, of employees that they could have, um, and their focus therefore was ensuring uh, to have the, the the people to get in production to get the the, the products out. Our research shows that this really impacted some of the preventative maintenance uh, work, the, the compliance audit, uh, the more of uh, uh, debris around the work area that really resulted uh, in this uh, um, uh, incidence of factory fires that, that overall resulted in disruptions. Um, there's been a lot of extreme weather events um, that we have witnessed um, over the past uh, six months, uh, most notably, um, um, the Texas uh, uh, polar vortex freeze um, that really, um, you know, brought petrochemical companies and thereby um, the entire plastic polymer supply chains um, to almost a grinding halt due to a lot of force majeures um, that, that these petrochemical companies um, started issuing. Um, then there, there has been droughts and wildfires that have raged in the U.S. Uh, West Coast um, and also extreme weather and heat waves in, uh, in, in around the Mediterranean, Europe, um, Canada, wildfires, uh, and uh, something that is very uh, um, notable and, and important is the, the, the drought in Taiwan, um, which impacts the significantly um, 
water, uh, uh, the wafer fabs that, that rely significantly on massive am amounts uh, of water. So all of these states that, that, that supply chain disruptions um, are here to stay. They have always been there. Um, and we have a supply chain, and this is the life um, that uh, a supply chain practitioner um, has to, uh, to face uh, in ensuring that he is running uh, a very uh, resilient supply chain. Um, a little background on the event watch and the event watch AI. Um, uh, is there a question? Okay. All right. Um, event watch is uh, our, uh, our Ayush Agarwal, please put yourself on mute. Um, if there's no question, I will proceed. Okay. So, um, Event Watch is our uh, is a premier supply chain monitoring and uh, uh, disruption notification tool. When we started Event Watch um, uh, a decade or so back, we were covering a limited number of industries, um, primarily covering um, uh, events around weather disruptions, factory fires, um, and a very small uh, list of events. But over the years. You know, after receiving a lot of feedback from some of our um, customers, we really expanded the scope uh, of Event Watch. We invested significantly in technology, uh, brought in a lot of these AI and ML um, um, uh, technologies, NLP, to uh, to really expand the scope. Event Watch AI today covers um, screens over. 4.3 million data sources um, from you know, syndicated news, um, uh, open news sources, social media coverage, et cetera, and generates about close to 5.5 million news feeds and data points each day. Um, all of this is uh, across over 100 different languages. Um, and then um, we have got got AI models that, that would then parse through um, all of this, this, this feed um, and then identify um, and clear out redundancies, identify key entities, key relationship, um, and give and narrow it down to the very small vital few um, events and incidents that have a potential to disrupt uh, um, a company's uh, supply chain. Um, these uh, events are then notified to our customers through our solution, and these supply chain impacting events uh, are what we have captured uh, here in the year-on-year -year graph. So, so what is it that we are witnessing today is, is essentially um, a perfect storm, um, a black swan, uh, perhaps a black swan of black swan events. Um, if, we, if we just look at, at last year, um, just about anything and everything that could go, long, go wrong um, from a supply chain uh, uh, perspective has, has indeed gone down. Um, our data shows um, that these disruptions uh, affected record number of, uh, of industries all of which experienced massive surges in, 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 uh, in shortages, price increases of raw materials, allocations, lines down, um, and cash flow problems. Uh, of course, a lot of um, um, customers were impacted. A lot of these problems emanated essentially due to the on again, off again nature um, of, 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 of uh, restrictions um, around COVID-19 uh, worldwide. The, the, the already cloudy demand picture was not helped by these reopening activities. When COVID-19 actually first started, um, a lot of companies had to, to, to retool, adjust um, um, to, to the wearing nature and demand, had to, to retool their manufacturing, their, their, their distribution network, 
um, their processes to now cater to smaller packet sizes because a lot of companies, um, restaurants, schools were shut and the demand that was coming was in actually smaller packet sizes coming directly from the consumers. When the first stage of uh, the lockdowns were restricted, uh, were, were, uh, were lifted, it kind of rebalanced uh, the demand, so to say. But then came the Delta variant and uh, uh, forcing uh, another round of shutdowns, um, delay, you know, shutting down schools, delaying the um, um, uh, return to office plans, and then companies that were just readjusting back um, into the larger packet sizes, larger demand signals had to almost um, you know, readjust real time to, uh, to cater uh, to the new demand uh, signals that were coming. This defied a lot of all the historical trends um, uh, that, that uh, planning systems uh, have uh, and, and planners have relied on. So this brought in a new level of uncertainty. Um, in the US, uh, even today, we are, we are witnessing significant labor shortages. Um, as a result of COVID, uh, you know, trade wars, a regulatory environment, et cetera. There is a lot of uh, uh, the government, the US government is promoting um, a lot of onshore manufacturing and is investing in a lot of, um, uh, of factory infrastructure. But the reality that we see today uh, and we hear from our customers is that um, we are actually struggling um, uh, to, to fill in uh, our factories with workers today, or even to transport material to, to cater uh, on time to cater to the, to the present demand. Uh, then, um, you know, we have the container shortages. Um, Post COVID, um, a lot of uh, uh, stay at home, uh, uh, kids, uh, work personal, ensured that there has been a surging demand in consumer electronics. Um, there has been a significant um, uh, increase in imports into the West from Asia. What it created is significant uh, uh, cargo freight, um, uh, ocean freight from, from Asia into the West. And what we are seeing now is a very skewed um, container uh, uh, disruption. Right? Um, on, on, on the US West Coast, we can see ports that have got um, you know, empty containers that are piled up. While if you go to the East uh, in, 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 into the ports in China, um, that's, that's piling up with finished goods that is waiting to be shipped. But uh, um, there is no way to ship because there's no containers uh, to put them in. Um, then we had the Suez Canal uh, blockage that added to the already constrained uh, uh, ocean freight. Um, we continue to see significant delays um, in, uh, in handling of, of container traffic in ports. Essentially, uh, due to COVID restrictions ar around personnel, um, the significant backlog, older systems, um, and all in all, this is creating significant blockages and delays in shipping. Um, at this juncture, what we have seen is uh, companies that could, could actually um, afford or could, uh, you know, in the light of these um, uh, freight delays, ocean freight delays, if they could afford to, to fly in their products, they started to, to expedite uh, through, through, through air cargo. But uh, now some of the existing routes for air cargo, which is usually taken up by, uh, by, by premium semiconductor, high value semiconductor supplies. Now they were winding up for capacity um, leading to further and more delays. Uh, the perfect storm, as you can see, um, 
the result, uh, as you see uh, on, on, on the right, it, it summarizes uh, what we have seen as a result of this perfect um, storm. Uh, this has resulted in, in cost increases, um, delivery problems, uh, profit warnings, um, inability to serve customers and uh, companies um, um, actually putting uh, uh, their customers on allocation. Uh, so, so these are the implications uh, that we have seen. Um, and these are the implications of what happens when supply chains go down. Um, worst case, it can lead to companies uh, going bankrupt, um, companies issuing force majeures, um, and in certain industries uh, like healthcare um, uh, or life sciences, uh, patient life uh, and well-being, so to say, gets impacted. Um, one of uh, the shortages of uh, our present lifetime or our, our lifetime, the semiconductor shortages. Okay? Um, I'll like to dwell a little bit uh, based on what we have seen, um, our experience and the data that we are seeing. Um, we believe this is here to stay, at least for some time. It's not going to get solved. Uh, but where did this all start, right? Um, when COVID happened um, or it, uh, in, in 2020 early uh, and forced a series of lockdowns across the world, a lot of companies, a lot of auto companies made some panic PO cancellations uh, as many companies expected the de their demand to go down significantly. Um, then they lost their spot to all these consumer ele uh, electronics companies who booked in um, the available capacity uh, as a result of, of consumers um, buying into laptops, uh, computers, gaming consoles, gym equipment, um, et cetera. Um, once uh, the early restrictions were, were lifted, uh, what was not expected is the demand uh, for auto came back in surging. And that really put in um, uh, you know, the semiconductors um, supply chain, um, which is already constrained, uh, most semiconductor uh, uh, companies uh, and suppliers have 16 to, to 18 week lead times at best. And most wafer fabs, um, we know, run at peak capacity, almost at 95%. So this brought in significant levels of disruption into semiconductors. Um, semiconductors, as we know, is, is there in, e in every product uh, and has a presence today in everything that we touch from consumer electronics to, to auto, to IoT. So this is now a very significant disruption. Um, we, we also hear companies and countries who, because of this disruption, um, are planning to add semiconductor capacities. Um, but all that uh, this has done is uh, in fact create a bigger demand for semiconductors. Now the, the semiconductor equipment uh, uh, lead times um, are out by 12 months. Guess what? Uh, the semiconductor equipment also need semiconductors, right? So that's why we say semiconductor shortages are here to stay. Um, uh, the product that, that really powers uh, uh, you know, human experience as we know it, um, the digital world as we know it. Um, if, if we continue to see these disruptions, um, we believe that it will set us uh, back in our innovation trajectory uh, by several years. Now, um, if, if you were in some of the companies uh, as a supply chain professional, uh, you really thought you got lucky and were able to, to secure your supply chain uh, for, for, for semiconductor products. That's not the end of the road. There are significant other shortages in chemicals, in polymers, wood 
uh, pallets for, for packaging and logistics, right? And, um, and we continue to see constraints and allocations. So how do you, how do you plan this? How do you prepare yourself um, uh, for this? How did we get here? Um, for the last several years, in fact, for, for a better part of the last 10 to 20 years, um, and for most of the last six years that I have been working uh, with my customers, um, hearing about uh, how they plan, a lot of uh, procurement teams, supply chain uh, practitioners, the prime focus has always been um, on cost reduction, right? This uh, really uh, brought in lean technologies just in times and drove down inventory levels to a significant level. Um, the the, the single-minded focus on reducing costs uh, and, and thereby return uh, shareholder value actually meant that there were certain companies that did not really invest uh, in capabilities that could bring in a certain level of information, intelligence, and insights um, uh, that, uh, that could bring in some level of resiliency in their supply chain. Um, we have also seen, um, um, and our data suggests that um, post the, pan, uh, the early stage right, uh, of the pandemic, when, when the supply shortages actually really uh, started uh, to flare up, some of these companies actually ditched uh, their just-in-times, uh, uh, their lean methodologies, and actually started uh, um, holding up on inventory, uh, suspecting another disruption in, in uh, which, 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 which would come. So this, you know, adding of the inventory and hoarding of the inventory it results in several hundreds of uh, thousands, uh, if not millions of dollars in, in, in pent up um, uh, of in, inventory, right? So if, 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 uh, if the, the lack of information towards resilience and, and bringing down uh, inventory levels, if you think that was a mistake, um, hoarding up inventory, um, thinking that you know, we will save ourselves, uh, we will stay ahead of the game uh, uh, on account of these disruption is also, in my view, a problem, right? Um, supply chains, um, you know, they power our lives. Um, the risk in the supply chain is when uh, we cannot sustain operations. Uh, and deliver consistent results from our supply chain. Uh, and that has got massive financial consequences. Uh, the only way out, uh, in my view, is to bring in information and intelligence um, to power your supply chain um, decision-making. So let's, so we've all looked at the problem. Uh, we, we know that uh, this, uh, this is here to stay one way or the other. Um, so how do we, we equip ourselves um, and plan uh, to bring in systems, tools, and technologies? We start off by first looking into uh, the nature of our supply chains. Um, when, when, when we speak to, uh, to customers, um, I, 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 you know, when, when we onboard customers, speak to them, um, we see some of the information uh, the customers already know. Um, a supply chain is, is usually very layered, right? There are your, your, your suppliers from whom you, you procure parts, products from. These suppliers in turn use uh, other suppliers to get certain um, raw materials, parts. Um, there are contract manufacturers. Um, there, there's a distribution line, um, um, and so on and so forth. So, the one of the key things in gain in, in, in the in the path towards getting information, the intelligence, is to having this knowledge 
of your supply chain, which is essentially knowing what are the products um, that, that you have, who are the suppliers, um, who are the tier one suppliers, who are your direct suppliers or indirect suppliers, so to say, that you use um, in, um, uh, in ensuring that, that, that these products are, um, uh, uh, are out of your, your factories. Um, how many contract manufacturers that they use? Who are your sub-tier suppliers? Um, um, where are their sites? Um, do you have information on their recovery time, right? This is the kind of information um, that, that we believe uh, is needed to start off with. Uh, this is what we traditionally call as supply chain mapping. The second information um, that, that you would need uh, as a practitioner would be information around disruptions um, occurring across the globe. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. So, so this, 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 why is this important? Is because what, what we see is as you dwell deeper into your supply chain, the visibility drops significantly. Um, when, when we onboard new customers um, and uh, um, I, I, I receive their, when they provide the, the list of suppliers, um, we see my experience tells me and when I interview them, uh, they tell me that, that they have fairly decent level of say about 70 to 80% um, of visibility into hundreds uh, of their tier one suppliers. They have about 70 to 80% visibility into some known risks, uh, like a sourcing risk, um, uh, solvency or financial risk, um, location risk, um, um, what is the recovery times. But then um, there, is, there are a lot of other risks um, that they don't really track. Then there is the remaining 25%, which is still un unaccounted for, right? So um, this is just for the tier one suppliers. Um, as we go uh, and, and lower and, and look for uh, the suppliers to, uh, lower down tier two um, and lower, you know, our customers realize that 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 it, it, it is fairly alarming that that they uh, have lesser and lesser visibility and untimely um, less control over the risk. Um, so that's where the mapping exercise really needs to start is to get this information of your tier one suppliers, their, their locations, and then. Uh, you know, collect information of sub-tier and so on. Um, if, if you think that the worst is really over, no, it's not. Um, disruptions, uh, supply chains have been disrupted over the years and uh, they continue, to, um, and I think they will continue to be. Uh, perhaps because the future is so unbound, uh, most likely the, the, the worst supply chain disruption is probably ahead of us. So uh, it all boils down therefore uh, to, um, to, to having in, uh, intelligence uh, and data for us to take effective actions more proactively <clears throat> and more predictively, excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so aside from the lack of visibility, there is also another critical issue. Uh, there are time and personal constraints um, when, when you have to go assessing um, uh, your supplier risks. And, and therefore, uh, supplier risk assessments are therefore only limited uh, to the top 20% uh, of your direct uh, suppliers where you, where, where, where you run the most number of transactions. We already know uh, that this exposes uh, companies to blind spots because 80% of the risk really emanates uh, from, the, from the lower tiers. Um, 
So how do we go about doing this mapping? It may, and what really is the supply chain mapping that we are referring to? Um, when, when some companies rely on, on data uh, on their suppliers, which are available in public sources. Um, it's a good start. Um, a lot of uh, companies do publish um, their locations, their offices, their factory location, but it, it, it usually ends up creating a lot of noise. Um, when, when, we, when we work with, these, uh, with some of the companies, we see that uh, there is very little information on, on core manufacturing sites. Most times that the data, uh, when, when our resource teams looks at the, the data that the customer has provided, uh, they realize that these are not really the manufacturing locations. Right? Uh, these would be office addresses or, or, finance, uh, or addresses where you can build them to. Uh, offices, uh, perhaps um, you know, in the Valley, in, in the US um, uh, or in UK, but the real production, the real manufacturing of these components might be happening in Taiwan and China, um, uh, Vietnam and so on and so forth. So you really need to make sure that, that the information, the manufacturing information is coming from your suppliers. And that's where you need to have this ecosystem where um, and, and the systems in place where, where you have an ability to collaborate and work with your suppliers um, uh, so that uh, they can provide uh, secure information securely about their supply chains. Um, when, when, we, when we start our journey with, uh, with our customers, um, you know, mind you, these are some of the largest customers uh, in their industry, some billion dollar, uh, several billion dollar companies. Uh, when, we, when we start off, um, these are companies that, that have hundreds, if not thousands of suppliers. Where we start off is by, uh, by starting off uh, by mapping their, their suppliers and their sites. We then go about uh, going to the direct suppliers and collecting information um, of the suppliers that they use. Um, and then the sites that their sub-tier suppliers uh, uh, would be using uh, um, uh, to service them uh, or to provide materials to them. As we, as we, as we grow, uh, uh, on in this relationship, um, our customers realize uh, the value um, in this information and are able to work with their suppliers. There is a little bit of effort that is needed here, um, but as, as you go up the value chain and then you start collecting, uh, uh, you know, part of site mapping, uh, which uh, essentially is information uh, where your the bomb components, uh, the parts which go into uh, your products. Where is each of this part coming from? Uh, you know, how many suppliers do I rely on to get this, this part? Where are their manufacturing locations? Where, uh, what are my suppliers? Uh, uh, rather, where are their suppliers? Uh, where in um, uh, in the uh, in the world um, do they source their materials from? What is their 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 their, uh, their shipping route? Right. What is uh, uh, the recovery time for these sites? Right. And you finally go into building this um, uh, in and bringing in a lot of business continuity plan uh, um, for from from these suppliers. Um, and that's where the real value um, comes in. Um, at a minimum, we always ad advocate that all single source and sole source uh, parts uh, used in, in high revenue products, they need to be covered under the mapping. Um, these are where the sourcing risks are high, has a direct impact uh, um, to revenue. Right? 
So this is, um, you know, very pertinent and interesting. Um, the data that, that we sometimes receive from our companies um, and what we have seen uh, in reality from, from the past several years, the focus uh, usually has been on the high spend, right? Uh, you know, as procurement professionals, you want to focus on your high spend. It's usually 20% of your suppliers contribute to 80% um, of your spend. Um, it's not unusual for, for, for us to receive uh, the initial data set of, uh, uh, from customers um, who have thousands of suppliers. We already know that. Uh, and when they provide us a small set and we, we ask them uh, to give us more information on these suppliers, they say, hey, I'm going to be focusing on my high spend suppliers. Um, these are the top 20% of the suppliers that are contributing uh, to 80% of the spend. I would like to start here. This is, this is where, uh, you know, we actually talk with these companies and, and tell them um, to, to, to look not really at spend, but by, by, by revenue impact. Um, what do we mean by revenue impact? Is to look at, 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 at the products that have significant, that bring in significant revenue. Um, there are um, looking at parts um, that have, uh, that go into the making of these products, looking at suppliers that go into the making of these high revenue products and to prioritize um, uh, their, uh, um, their, their, risk, their, their visibility and mapping exercises from there. Uh, there has been significant examples uh, that we can quote uh, where a lot of supply chains have been disrupted, not by some of your high spend suppliers, but risk emanating from, from these smaller spend, 80% of the suppliers that contribute to the smaller spend, right? Um, we don't really need to look uh, really far. Um, it, news that has been open worldwide in, tw in 2020, post COVID, healthcare and hospital supply chain were disrupted and, and came down um, because of lack of PPEs, the personal protective equipment, the masks, the gowns, the, the gloves, they only constitute three to 5% of, uh, and of, the, of spend of the entire hospital supply chain. But it, it was the PPEs uh, that, that hospitals really struggled in. Then there is uh, the Asahi Casey incident. Um, I, I encourage all, all students to look up uh, um, and, and read about uh, the Asahi Casey microsystems um, and uh, uh, the, the fire uh, in their Japan factory that happened in October 2020. Right? Um, the, the, this factory uh, is the one uh, that Asahi Casey uses um, to, to, uh, to manufacture uh, large-scale integrated uh, um, um, chips um, that, that are used um, in, uh, uh, in a lot of audio devices, car stereos, um, um, uh, oscillators, um, and, and, and a lot of other consumer electronics. Um, Asahi Casey um, is the leader um, and has over 90% plus market share uh, in these, uh, these chipsets. And, and a lot of, uh, um, of suppliers rely on, on these ICs as, as part of their, their, their bomb products. So what we, you know, it was very interesting, right? Uh, for us witnessing this, uh, because um, our companies who had visibility um, into this, uh, 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 you know, into this issue as it was unfolding, uh, had mapped Asahi in our systems. Uh, when we reported this news out first, 
uh, remember, uh, and if you if you look it up, I, perhaps if you you may be able to look at the timing differences. This news first first broken in 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 a, in a local language website, not very popular. It it never really came to any of the mainstream um, English websites, news websites early on. It took several hours before this news actually came in. Um, in, in the mainstream websites. Um, when, when we reported this, um, you know, this resulted uh, in immediate response from a lot of our, uh, our companies. Companies that did not have information of this, uh, of this event or got, got news um, uh, of, of the Asahi KC fire that uh, burning um, were left to, to pick up the pieces, so to say, because companies that had this information were already going to, to distributors and what have you to pick up uh, whatever inventory was left. And these chipsets, which, which normally would, would be a few cents to a few dollars, now was commanding um, over $20 um, in, 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 the, in the market that's several thousand percent increase in a raw material price. Look what it would do to your profitability um, of the products to which it goes into. Um, what is also very interesting is uh, about a month or so from, uh, from uh, when this uh, factory fire uh, occurred um, in the Asahi uh, um, um, factory in Japan, they, they actually issued an advisory to all of their customers uh, to look uh, for, for alternates as they expected that it would, it would not be before 2022 that they would be able to come, come all the way back up again. That is something that I really urge uh, you guys, uh, you know, students, enthusiasts to just look it up, um, very present, very um, a relatable issue that that uh, um, that we have seen. So, what is uh, so? Once you have this information, right? Um, there is really two approaches um, that that you then need to work on um, to um, to ensure your supply chains are protected. Um, the first one is a news and alert based workflow um, where you have systems, um, you know, you, you, what we do is we, we have event watch AI that notifies customers of, uh, uh, of, of disruptions um, that, that we pick up from social media, from public news sources and report them um, uh, as soon as we get them. Um, that is the timely notification of a disruption, um, but that disrupt uh, that news is is only relevant, so to say, if you know um, that there are that you have sites in that specific region, you have uh, you have a supply chain uh, in that specific region. So that's where the mapping really comes in, right? Um, for example, when um, um, you know, if you go back to the to the example of of the early days of COVID, um, EventWatch uh, was able to pick up a pneumonia like uh, uh, like, uh, like virus uh, being reported in social media chatter in local news events uh, uh, in 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 social media chatter in local language. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we started monitoring this uh, on, I think it was on the 27th or the 28th of December, and we kept monitoring this news. And on the 4th of January, 2020 is when we initially notified our customers um, um, as, 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 a, as a high impact event. Um, and uh, we actually, you know, sent geofence the entire Wuhan area and sent a notification out to our customers. Uh, that this is um, an incident that we are tracking that has potential uh, for serious disruptions. Um, a lot of companies uh, that I worked with, uh, they benefited significantly 
Um, a lot of companies started setting in their own war rooms, relied extensively on the data from their mapping, from, uh, from the news sources, um, you know, scenario plannings were being done uh, to get ahead of, uh, um, uh, um, of this as much as possible. Remember what started uh, just in Wuhan, it really spread uh, across the world. Uh, there's Germany, France, USA, um, India, and every other country. Prior to, to this, most disruptions have been largely local, right? You, the, the worst disruptions have been uh, the, 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 Fukush the, the tsunami and, and the Fukushima uh, incident in Japan, um, Thailand for floods, um, some capacitor shortages. Um, these have been localized events, right? Uh, the, the, the playbooks that, that a lot of companies have, might have created was essentially to, um, the reactionary playbook was uh, to, to secure alternate supplies from an alternate source, uh, to shore up inventory and so on and so forth. But with, with the global nature of this pandemic, unless you really have your suppliers map and you're tracking where your supply chains are, which are the neighborhoods that are getting uh, impacted by the lockdowns, it, the, you are, uh, unless you have invested in these capabilities, um, it, it definitely puts you um, at risk uh, to an imminent disruption. Uh, the value that you have in having all of this information is essentially uh, you can now be really proactive. Uh, you can now, um, uh, you know, benchmark your suppliers. You can collect more. Uh, you can you can scorecard your suppliers, uh, identify the different risks, uh, plot those risks. Um, Maybe financial, um, geopolitical, location-related risk. Um, um, ESG, uh, a hot topic um, uh, of presently, um, which is sustainability, environment, governance, um, or even cybersecurity. Um, you run these assessments with your uh, with, with suppliers, get information on their prep, uh, on their cybersecurity preparedness, on their hurricane preparedness, and have a system where you can actually collate all this information, quantify score and rate these risks, right? This is where uh, we have the, the, the proactive uh, uh, supply chain, right? Um, investments um, in technology, in information, um, uh, bringing in collaboration tools that, that allow you to work with your suppliers real time um, to, uh, Uh, work with your suppliers real time um, to get more information on disruptions um, uh, as they occur. Um, I think this is uh, is what is our recommendation, and this is where um, you know um, supply chains uh, will bring in the information and the intelligence uh, to really take informed decisions. So, so what's the uh, what's in it for the practitioners, right? What is what does success really looks like, right? Um, it is. Um, it it remember this is a journey. You 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 don't just invest in uh, um, in a technology, identify a partner um, like us perhaps that is doing has been doing this for years and expect uh, to be resilient overnight. No, that does not happen. Right, uh, um, you start off. Um, you know, let's let's look at companies that believe um, they don't have this uh, this information, this live monitoring uh, and disruption system. They will invest a few hundred uh, uh, or of thousands of dollars um, in bringing in this monitoring system. Right now, from a, re a state where you are really reactive you are now aware of, of some of uh, the disruptions that would occur um, in your supply chain, in and around your supply chain. This visibility 
over, over a period of time will result in several thousands, if not million, millions um, in, in dollar saving. And as, as you work up uh, uh, the, the maturity curve, um, uh, you know, you really start collaborating and working with your suppliers, building a, a transparent ecosystem um, uh, where suppliers actually start um, uh, providing more information and you start rating, uh, scoring, uh, prioritizing them. Um, significant value um, that we see is when um, you actually bring in, uh, bring in multi-tier mapping that we talked about. Um, this uh, is where the ROI starts to climb significantly. Um, this is where instead of paying a, a, a premium uh, a twenty dollar premium uh, on on a part that costs a few cents, you are able to eliminate this distress spend um, almost entirely. This is where um, the ROI really starts. Uh, oops, sorry, um, starts to kick in. Um, the data that we have suggests that in the last quarter alone. Right, um, uh, companies have spent in excess of 100 to 150 million in just freight expedites. And if you think about it, um, you know, supply chains having, um, you know, cost of risk in several hundred millions, if not billions of dollars, uh, having the risk programs, uh, having a risk program, investing in, 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 in information even though you start small, but if you start growing uh, in your maturity, uh, what we have seen is companies are able to realize uh, you know, significant values of cost savings year on year. Uh, if, if you talk about hundreds of millions in, in risk, uh, um, uh, even if you're able to save a, a half of this, because of our proactive, uh, because of the information that we have, because of the proactive systems that we put in year on year, that is significant dollars saved, right? That is where, what brings uh, uh, value and returns um, to, to your shareholders. So uh, the focus um, uh, that, that we advocate is on, uh, on change management, um, be more, uh, proactive, bring in information um, and the intelligence uh, in your supply chain by monitoring, uh, mapping, uh, and, and stay ahead of the next disruption, so to say, um, and to be able to take informed decisions and source uh, before um, anyone else. Um, this really um, has been Resilink's mission uh, which is uh, to make global supply chains uh, resilient, sustainable, fair, and secure. Uh, we have uh, uh, the systems and the technology um, that, that offers end-to-end -end supply chain um, um, uh, supplier performance management solutions, um, early warning notifications, and really what we call the LinkedIn uh, uh, of supply chain. Right. So, um, with that, I will um, uh, I would like to um, to to end. Um, supply chains um, have shaped our world. Right. Um, we we live. Uh, we have humanity. As as I started off, humanity has always relied on supply chains to enrich their lives. Um, supply chain disruptions are here to say to to stay. Um, what is it that can bring us, uh, um, uh, what is it that we need is to bring in that information and intelligence to, to power our decision making. Um, to, to all the budding students and, and potential practitioners uh, supply, uh, who, who would want to venture into the supply chain space out there, you know, it's, it's the, you know, we believe it's the best ever time to be in supply chain. We, of course, we have witnessed the mother of all 
um, all disruptions the past two years. But we, 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 what we have been talk, talking for the last decade or so um, has been a, a need to, to be resilient, a need to improve maturity, need to get information. Um, the pandemic only proved that, that information in silos, information uh, in, in spreadsheet and in, uh, in a practitioner's head is not something that you can rely on. Uh, pandemic only proved um, that if you don't have the information, uh, if you only focus on inventory and cost reduction, you are sure to get disrupted. A lot of our companies have, uh, uh, who, have, who have invested uh, in bringing up these capabilities um, um, have, have been able to significantly minimize the risk uh, in their supply chain. So um, for, for, for students, um, I urge you to take on this, uh, um, this challenge. Uh, supply chains are going to get complex disruptions will continue. Um, and as you venture into supply chain, uh, know that you know, we will look forward to ideas, contributions, and to challenge um, status quo, so to say, uh, what we've been doing. We look forward to, uh, to, to your, your insights and expertise as well um, to, to really um, uh, set the supply chain uh, for the future. Um, with that, um, I conclude my uh, uh, speech or address, so to say, and um, um, I can open it up now if there are any questions. Sir, yeah, so uh, thank you for uh, sharing such valuable insights, sir, and everything that you talked about disruption management and the role of AI and ML and information and intelligence in mitigating risks end to end. Uh, I'm sure the audience was delighted to hear your thoughts and as we have received a ton of questions. So uh, me and Tanya will direct a few of them towards you right now. Sure. The first question that we have here is, sir, uh, that how has AI helped us reduce supply chain risks and are there any new technologies or processes that are being implement, implemented at Resilink? Sure. Great question to start off with. Yeah. So what we had seen when we started off event, what as we said, right? Uh, we were relying uh, on information that we were gathering and collecting uh, with very little investments in technology. Uh, some numbers that, 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 that we talked about was very important. We are, we are looking, you know, disruptions that occur can occur anywhere. The news that, that uh, sources them are some of the most prominent news sources that we know of, they're all English news sources. Um, they are uh, the major newspapers don't really cover disruptions that occur um, in, a, in a remote factory location, say in Vietnam. Um, um, the local language news site is, is one that actually covers this. So, so if you really have to stay ahead uh, of disruptions uh, and get um, um, information on time, you now have to collect information from news sources, social media, and every language possible where in from every country or location where you have your supply chain presence. That's a ton of work. That's a lot of data to collect, parse, and, uh, um, and, and generate intelligence out of. So that's where we need to rely on, on, on AI, uh, ML, um, natural language processing, uh, to be able to, to collect all of this data, parse this information, there is a significant amount of noise that gets generated um, uh, when we collect this information. If it is not, if you don't em employ technologies like AI, you, you, it, it's just not possible to get the intelligence um, uh, out. Um, you will be sending, spending an inordinate amount of time just trying to make sense from the noise, right? Um, 
there is significant returns, um, you know, personal savings, resource costs, just because you're now relying on, on AI to, to bring you um, timely information on, uh, on events and, and impacts. Um, event watch is just one of the solutions that, that we refer to. Um, um, uh, the suite of solutions that that um, um, that Reslink has been working on uh, with our uh, uh, customers, uh, we have um, a lot of AI ML based solutions. Uh, we have Commodity Watch AI that actually um, leverages um, um, to a small extent the, the the Event Watch and then brings in um, uh, uh, AI models that is now able to correlate. Uh, entity relationship bring in hundreds of different variables that impact commodity prices that that shape commodity demand and supply um, um, and gives us information around uh, several commodities like gold um, aluminium copper uh, even paper uh, so to say for that uh, matter so we use um, uh, technology, to, uh, to, I, to first get in, to look into the historical data, um, use the models to identify patterns, identify the variables that, that, uh, um, uh, that we see uh, can create a demand and a supply fluctuation, which in, in turn might result in a price fluctuation upward or downward, and are able to come up with, uh, uh, with insights into commodity pricing. Um, then there is, uh, um, uh, you know, we have several other predictive uh, models that we have uh, built uh, under disruptions. Uh, weather watch AI is one which focuses sp specifically on weather used extensively by retail chains uh, where they would want to, to know what is my threshold where I need to shut uh, my retail store um, uh, in, in New York? Um, normally, a heavy rain uh, may not really disrupt a lot of industries, but um, if, if, if you're a retail store, you need to know what are those thresholds that you need to shut. So it's a separate solution because the thresholds here are different. And to rely on geographical and weather related information from across the globe uh, and identifying and, and bringing up these thresholds which are pertinent locally, again, uh, there is AI that, that you need. Um, a lot of other predictive uh, uh, models in, in, in predicting the nature uh, of, of your PO delays, um, then there is uh, something that we, uh, we are very excited that is coming in the future that will, that will help uh, bring in um, transportation routes and so on uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, that's what we are working on. Okay, so thank you, sir. Uh, Tanya can take up the next question. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing such insight, such insights with us. So the next question we have for you is: uh, Once risk is identified. What procedure uh, do you suggest for quantifying the risk? With quantif quantification, do you advise optimization methods also? Good, uh, good questions. So when you say, when you identify the risk, uh, it's very important to know what is the risk, right? Um, uh, the risk can emanate from, you know, there can be financial risk, location risk, there could be regulatory risk, compliance, uh, cybersecurity. Identification of the risk is important. Now, um, you cannot really look at it in isolation. Um, you, you have to look at your supply chain and be able to bring in this information and to be able to, to actually rate or rank the risk so that you can look at uh, at suppliers across and be able to um, uh, to rate them in so to say uh, in a weighted scale, right? So having that system to to I to prioritize um, which supplier has the risk and which is the risk that I need to mitigate is also important. There may be risks uh, that uh, maybe you can live with. 
must be a very small, uh, must be a supplier for which you have got, uh, you, you know, you, you, you might have a risk uh, where a, a supplier does not have any alternate sites, uh, relies on a single uh, site for supplying materials. So his, his uh, are, and has a very high recovery time. So he might show up very high in, in the recovery risk and, and, and continuity risk. But maybe this is um, a very commonly available part and you already have four other alternate suppliers from where you source from. Do you really want to mitigate this, this risk? No. So you need to first have a system where you are able to, to bring all these risk elements together and juxtapose it and, and look at it across your supply chain. Once you identify and prioritize the risk, um, uh, once you identify, you then prioritize, look at the, the elements of risk that have key impact to your supply chain. Um, you know, that is when you start to work on it. Um, the, the way we quantify it in our system is looking at risk from a one to 10 score, 10 being the highest risk and one uh, is where there's low risk, right? Um, once the risk has been identified, there are various collaboration tools. We, we, we encourage our customers to work with their suppliers in, in minimizing that risk. If it is, um, if, if I take a similar issue, let's say it's, 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 a, um, uh, it's a supplier that does not have, uh, um, have an al uh, alternate side, or let's say if it's a supplier from where you really cannot do dual sourcing, you really rely on that supplier and he just supplies you from from one location, you work with the supplier to see uh, if he can supply from, from an alternate location, if he has those capabilities. If not, you see if he can improve uh, on his business continuity processes, right? There is no one solution, but you, you systematic, systematically look at the risk, identify the possible ways of mitigation, work with your suppliers, and try to eliminate that risk before that risk starts to bite you. Okay, sir. Yeah, so we would like to conclude the keynote speech here, sir. Thank you for so much uh, insights on the supply chain disruption management. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, thank you, sir. Supply chains today are closely tied up with globalization. Uh, with extended supply chains, uncertainty and risks have increased exponentially, particularly after the COVID pandemic. Hence, the resiliency in supply chain becomes paramount. And companies like Resilink help other organizations to manage their risk and become more resilient. So thank you very much, Rohit, sir, for this exhilarating talk, which has set the base for the proceedings to come. We would sure. now like to... Sorry, sir. Sure. Thank you very much. And... Um, and um... You know, have a great rest of the day. Yeah, you too, I'm sir. sure there are some eminent speakers uh, in the queue. Thank you. Uh, uh, we would now like to present you with a memento uh, as well, sir, uh, as a token of our gratitude, which will be delivered to you very soon. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Moving on, it is with immense pleasure we present to you all our chief guest for this year's GSCM, Professor Sachin Kamble. Dr. Sachin Kamble is a professor of Digital Transformation, Operations and Strategy at EDHEC Business School, France. He holds a PhD in Management, MBA in Operations and Bachelor's degree in Mechanical Engineering from reputed Indian universities. He has been associated with various institutions of repute such as NITI Mumbai and Karnataka University in India. He has over 27 years of consulting experience with leading manufacturing organizations like GSK Pharmaceuticals, Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited, ACC Cements, Times Group, and many other prominent firms. He is listed in the top 2% of researchers globally, and he is one of the top five researchers in France. He has received the Best Research Paper Award in 2016 and 2012. We are delighted to have you amongst us, sir, and we request you to kindly share your thoughts and experiences. Thank you, Meanwhile, Daniel. We request the audience to pose their questions, if any, uh, in the chat box and direct them towards the Q&A POCs. 
Yeah, you can go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Tanya, and uh, a very good morning to all of you, all the participants on this platform uh, joining for this conference. And uh, before I start, uh, maybe I should also thank the organizing committee, uh, the conference chair for providing me an opportunity to be here uh, this morning and um, share my uh, experiences on supply chain disruption. So uh, I take this opportunity today uh, to present uh, one of my research paper uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, share the screen. Okay, so just confirm whether this screen is visible. Yes, sir, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just mentioning that uh, I take this opportunity to present uh, one of my research paper. And uh, this paper is on the theme of this particular conference and it's uh, highly relevant uh, to understand like say how the companies in the world uh, have reacted to the disruption of COVID-19. And uh, we see that it's not the end, it's still continuing. And recently the outbreak of Omicron is again, um, like say puzzling these industries and uh, it's, it's just uh, like say going to be much more challenging for them in the future. Uh, many countries in Europe uh, has already announced uh, lockdown and uh, like say the restrictions coming back into place. So uh, uh, I continue with uh, on to share my experience with uh, the disruptions that has uh, disrupted the supply chain. And specifically, we're going to talk about the disruptions that has occurred to do or two industries. Uh, that's the automobile and the airline industry. Uh, so this is going to be the flow of presentation uh, for the session today. So first I'll be introducing to you about uh, what this study is all about and some brief on the literature review. Uh, I'm not going to make it more theoretical or more academic based. It's going to be more of uh, the experience sharing uh, and that's going to be coming from these two industries. The methodology that uh, we have adopted uh, to study uh, how the companies are reacting to this situation. And then uh, I share you with the analysis and the findings. And then actually at the end, we'll be proposing a supply chain resilience framework, which could be used by the companies. And then we have the recommendations. Now, uh, this is uh, the details of the paper and I'll be sharing immediately after this uh, talk, uh, this paper with you, the link. And this paper is free for you to access and then you can find more details uh, if you feel that you're interested to know uh, more about this topic. Okay, so this is uh, something which is not new to us now because we have been uh, listening to this, we have been reading it uh, in many different mediums. And uh, we ourselves have been, like say, the victims of this uh, disruption uh, at a personal level. Uh, the pandemic effect, what we refer is to this uh, COVID-19 impact. Okay, so it was first identified in one city of China. It has affected millions of people in terms of their livelihood, in terms of the health, in terms of uh, their life. Uh, the government response strategies that has been displayed uh, to this uh, pandemic effect has been the lockdowns, uh, the social distancing norms, the use of masks and the border closures. Uh, when it comes to supply chain, uh, COVID-19 has impacted uh, very high on uh, different uh, supply chains. Okay, so it's both the manufacturing and the services industries. And uh, this has majorly come because uh, that's basically I'm referring to the manufacturing industries. Uh, this disruption has basically come because of uh, high dependence of many countries on China. And it was uh, first the China uh, wherein like, this COVID was uh, identified and uh, the first closures and the lockdowns happened in China. And then it had an contagion effect onto the different countries and uh, the supply chains of uh, different businesses. Now, this has impacted very badly and this has posed challenges to the practitioners uh, to come out with the response strategies and uh, be in line with uh, the current situations. Now, 
the motivation for this particular study when our team uh, decided to take uh, some work on this particular topic okay so we basically wanted to provide uh, some assessments on the supply chain resilience because uh, the previous literature were in like say uh, we could see a lot of things on the supply chain disruptions but then we couldn't find the appropriate strategies the companies could be using because more of many of the studies they focus more on like say what is supply chain disruptions and uh, how it has happened or, or or what type of impacts it has had on the supply chains but then there were very few like say which actually assessed the resilience of the companies and also they focused on the different strategies these companies could be using or the supply chains could be using and uh, actually there were no uh, empirical studies or empirical supports many of the papers were theoretical based or it was the simple case studies so with that motivation and the research gaps uh, we thought that okay this is the right area and the right motivation to conduct a research and uh, present our findings to the world so that it could be beneficial for these different supply chains to think on like so what different strategies the response strategies are available and if at all if required how they could be measuring the supply chain resilience now we had two research questions the first research question was like say the level of resilience okay of these two supply chains the manufacturing and the service supply chains against the covid-19 outbreak so what is the level of resilience okay so what impact this pandemic has had on these uh, two supply chains okay and whether these two supply chains the manufacturing and the service supply chains would be able to recover from this impact then as i told you there were no mitigation or the response strategies available to manage these disruptions and therefore we wanted to present uh, the supply chain practitioners with some short term and long term risk mitigation strategies which are being displayed and being used by the different practitioners across these supply chains now uh, some something uh, with regards to the background literature okay so this basically is talking about the impact uh, this uh, covid-19 has had on the supply chains so a uh, a uh, 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 research by nam usa in 2020 they reported that 78% of the companies in the world that's in in uh, specific to usa had an financial impact on the supply chains okay and pwc uh, in a study uh, in 2020 they mentioned about disasters impact on the supply chains in the us and mexico uh, also these uh, pwc report reported that like say not just the us and mexico but then the companies across the supply chains across east asia europe to usa all were disrupted okay and it's because this country's supply chains are worldwide okay they are suppliers are based in different parts of the world okay this has this has had an uh, supply chain contagion effect spreading across each region now coming to the impact on uh, the automobile sector okay so the impact because uh, if as you have seen the topic has uh, dealt to important sectors uh, the automobile and the airline so let's try to understand what impact this covid-19 has had on the automobile sector so here are a few of uh, the listings of the impacts taken from the actual uh, factual data so it has in uh, uh, so we know that automobile is a very important uh, sector or an industry which contributes highly towards the country's gdp and it's one of the sector which creates a, a high level of employment maybe almost 90% of the um, total population uh I, when i talk about an auto automobile sector it's just not the companies which are going to uh, produce the cars okay or the final products i am referring here also the ancillaries and the service industries associated with the automobile sector so referring to uk uh, the U so the uk's annual turnover it's a 82 billion pound okay and then to this economy like say the contribution from this industry is almost 18.6 billion pounds that's coming from the automobile sector uh when this covid impact was uh, witnessed many companies they started downsizing their workforce there were closure of the showrooms because of the lockdowns uh 
many of the uh, site operations okay they were closed like so the expansion plans of many automobile companies they were stalled uh, the employees were reduced as i told the workforce downsizing the sales in uk declined by almost 89% uh, there was a mazda toyota joint venture which was happening uh, in terms of uh, a new production facility and uh, that was worth 1.6 billion that venture got closed a uh, ford motor company they had you know that train station they had taken a facility uh, to come out with a service center that was closed and uh, general motor had to slow down its uh, production and many 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 companies across this world was uh, like say had to downsize their operations uh, they had to close their facilities and that's like say the production had to be stopped and that was mainly because of uh, the new norms coming in in terms of uh, the temperature screening the wearing of the medical grade mask and the social distancing and other things now coming to the impact of covid 19 on the airline industry now again we know that uh, this industry is uh, a labor a labor intensive industry and when i talk about an airline industry it's just not about the people and the staff working in an airline company okay uh, it's 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 a result it's a research coming from a, a study which says that for every one job lost in the airline industry there are other seven dependent jobs which are going to be lost in its allied industries or 7.5 jobs okay so what does it mean it means that like say the 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 airline industry has given support to many other allied industries which are dependent on the entire industry for example we talk about the hotel industry okay because we know that the more the people are going to travel okay the more the need for the hotels and the lodging and the boarding facilities okay and we know that when it comes to a hotel hotel is also a staff a labor intensive industry okay if the airline if the people are not able to move if the people are not able to uh, travel in that case the hotel bookings are not going to happen if the hotel bookings are not going to happen uh, then the impact is going to be again on the closure of the hotels and the downsizing of the employees uh, so that that is what uh, the connection we have uh, of the airline industry with the other industries in the hospitality sector now this sector also witnessed a significant job loss of almost like say 7 to 13% and this is the figures which i am referring uh, of uh, the year 2020 okay that that's around september 2020 uh many big uh, airline companies uh, they had to announce job cuts and uh, the unpaid leave regime started and uh, this impact basically uh, had impact as i told you on the other sectors and therefore we thought that okay this automobile and the airline industry are going to be the best candidates for our study because they just don't represent a, don't represent a specific sector in our society but then they are basically the indicators of the economy of a country so uh, both being supply chains which are complex and dynamic and uh, they are capital and the labor intensive okay and involve many dependent ancillaries we thought that this is what is going to be the right candidates for our study uh, there were certain industries wherein like say crisil in 2020 had mentioned uh, does have a very very low resilience towards this impact and in their study they had identified gems and jewelry steel real estate automobile and airline industry so that again supported our thought process that yes these are the two industries which have low resilience and then maybe it would be very interesting for us to know about how they are coping out with the challenges of covid 19 uh the crisil report had again mentioned that there are some industries which has high resilience and they are not going to be getting much impacted because of this covid and those industries where 
the fertilizers, the pharmaceuticals, the food, FMCG, and telecom sectors. Okay, so therefore we decided on to move with these two industries and um, okay, study the disruptions and the resilience and the strategies they would be adopting to overcome this particular situation. Now, exactly what is meant by supply chain resilience? Because we have been using this term, we talk about this term, but what is the actual definition of this term? Okay. So the supply chain's ability to prevent and absorb changes and regain the initial performance level after an unexpected disturbance. That is what is referred to as the supply chain resilience. Okay, so it's ability to prevent and absorb changes. The changes caused by different types of supply chain disruptions. Okay, and to hit back, that is basically to gain back the initial performance level. Okay, after the disruption has occurred. Now, how quickly these industries or these companies are able to come back to the normal? That is what is in simple, the meaning of supply chain resilience. Now, how do we measure the supply chain resilience? Okay, because I just heard for the previous session, like uh, one of the question asked by one of the uh, participant was like, say, how do we assess the supply chain resilience? Okay, now there are some modeling approaches. Okay, and we also have some theoretical approaches. Now, what are the different modeling approaches available to measure or assess the supply chain resilience? Okay, so it says that we can model the supply chain resilience assessment on using different metrics. And the researchers have identified five key metrics on which we can evaluate the company's performance. And that is the economic ability, the vulnerability of the supply chain, the recovery time, the uncertain situation that's looming around, and the resilience enhancement considerations. That's basically the strategies that are going to be available or going to be implemented by the company to fight the disruption. Now, uh, the performance loss could be also used to measure uh, the, or maybe to assess the supply chain resilience. Okay, and this performance loss is going to be measured uh, of the supplier's capacity and the service performance. So how well your supplier capacity, or maybe uh, how, how well your supplier is going to be performing when this recession is going to be happening or it has occurred. Okay, so we're going to make an assessment of how your supplier has been capable enough to provide you the same level of service performance. That is one of the methodology available to assess the supply chain resilience. And uh, we have uh, the recovery time, okay, that the company uses, okay, to reach back to its normal. So the amount of time the company can use to come back, okay, that predictions of this recovery time, that could be a measure of a supply chain resilience. And we can measure it with, with reference to this recovery time. Uh, the theoretical approaches, it says that, okay, instead of measuring the supply chain resilience of a supply chain, better we assess the resilience strategies that's going to be put forth by the companies. Okay, so some theoretical approaches, what they say is that, why do you want to measure the resilience when, like say, the disruption has already occurred? So why you want to like say no, okay, what has happened? Insert, you see the future. Insert, you see like how you can come back to the normal and for that, what strategies you're going to put in place. Okay, so that is what a few approaches has been proposed by the researchers. Okay, so it's basically the input output assessment for different mitigation strategies. Okay, so it basically says that, okay, you evaluate the strategies and then see like how well you can come back to your um, previous position and make the recovery. Uh, we saw uh, the uh, previous uh, literature on the supply chain resilience and uh, we focused that it was mainly more on the theoretical aspects and uh, it was exploring, exploring more of the enablers, the barriers, the antecedents, the practices, the capabilities of the companies and so on. So as such, like say the empirical studies on to how these companies are reacting actually that was not covered, but then yes, only the difficulties and the challenges that could be there in fighting the supply chain resilience was available to us in the literature. So 
uh, we can say that okay this could be uh, the first of uh, the type of studies which was there in this particular area wherein let's say we did uh, a combination of two approaches that is uh, we modeled the recovery time as well as we assess the resilience strategies so it was a mix of a modeling plus a theoretical approach now when it comes to the supply chain resilience strategies okay so there are going to be two categories one is the proactive strategy and the other is going to be the reactive strategy now what happens in the proactive strategy is that like say the companies are going to be preparing themselves for the next disruptions okay now that covid 19 has happened there has been a lot of uh, disruptions okay now the companies are very much like say, alert and they want to be proactive in the sense like say they want to build an infrastructure which can prevent them from such future disruptions like covid the other category of uh, strategy is the reactive strategy the reactive strategy is that like say now the companies were not that prepared and then the disruption has occurred like we see the covid 19 and how they are reacting to the situation okay so proactive is like say getting yourself prepared for the future disruptions by building a technical or technological based solutions and infrastructure whereas the reactive strategy is basically on at present how you are reacting to the disruption that has already occurred so here are a list of uh, proactive strategies that we identified from the uh, literature and uh, just not the literature we also interacted with some of the industry experts and we got to know that okay this could be the possible proactive strategies uh, i'm just going to read it out for you and uh, just give us brief uh, description on what these strategies are all about so the first one is the digital connectivity wherein the companies say that okay uh, for you to be proactive to the future challenges or the disruptions you have to build a strong digital infrastructure okay you have to use the different technologies that are available for you which can predict the future performance like internet of things blockchain technology digital twin simulations no, 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 not simulation but there's a digital twin for sure we should go for supply chain automation Okay, so that is basically we have to systemize the physical and the information workflow. And basically it talks about, again, the digitalization of the supply chain activities and the practices using the digital technologies with reference to digital connectivity. Now the question of uh, whether we should be localized or we should be regionalized. So basically like say earlier, we used to be talking about a globalized sourcing. Okay, but now again, when you talk about a proactive strategy, we are going to again come back to our basics, and that's about like say localization or the regionalization. Because the main lesson what many of the companies have learned this COVID disruption is that like say they were highly dependent on China, and when the China borders got closed, many of the plants across the world, okay, their manufacturing had come to and stop. Okay, so in fact in in terms like say if they could have developed some local uh, uh, suppliers in that case they could have just managed to run their business so this is uh, what the practitioners feel could be one of the proactive strategy integrated supply chain risk management system so it's basically talking about risk sharing across all the supply chains and again this is basically an outcome of how digitally connected you are there with your supply chain partners supply chain collaboration okay so this is how closely you're going to work together how closely you're going to work together to see the future challenges that could be coming okay and how well collaboratively you're going to plan about that okay so just not about uh, you your company being a manufacturing plant we're just talking about how would you be able to come out with this disruption or how you would be able to tackle this disruption the supplier sitting in some other country like say india he is independently thinking of how he's going to focus on this disruption no so we're going to talk over about like the collaboration and the integration aspects of how all these partners can come together and they can collectively plan the future news so that they're not going to be disrupted in the future and uh, the social supply chain focus that's the focus on the humanitarian and the social performance like say how you're going to take your employees into confidence. 
okay, this is a productive strategy because we have seen that abruptly many companies, they have just uh, laid off their employees without any notice and they were in a very, like say, bad situation. That That is what something which you would not like to have as a strategy. Okay, so how proactive you could be with respect to your planning, the manpower planning and how proactive you could be in seeing to it, like say in future, if such activities are going to again happen, okay, uh, is there any way, like say, this social focus is going to be there as a priority of your company? So that is like how you're going to take care of your employees, how you're going to win the confidence back of your employees. And finally, we talk about the human capabilities. So that is basically a trained workforce on using the future technologies. Okay, so that's what we refer to as to all the proactive strategies. Now coming to the reactive strategies. Okay, so reactive strategy in the sense, like as I told you, the deception has already occurred and now you want to react to this particular situation. Okay, now here is basically, uh, you just want to have a lifeline maintenance in the sense, like say the transportation should be on, it should be operating, the logistics should be working, so how you could make the logistics working in the sense, like say you're going to ask the government for some respite, you're going to ask some uh, the government to allow uh, the, uh, the, the, the transportation of goods by ship, by, uh, that's by sea, by road or by air, providing them special permissions to move and so on. Uh, big data driven and real time information system. So basically you would like to use the big data analytics capabilities. Okay, not the predictive nature at present, but then still you would like to connect yourself with your suppliers. And in this time when the disruption has already occurred, okay, the main important thing is the information. And the reactor strategy over here, what's listed is mainly focusing on like, say how you can develop a system which could capture the real time information and which could be able to capture the real time information coming from different countries and the companies operating in those countries. Uh, the growth of uh, virtual marketplaces. Okay, now that we have seen that uh, the physical interactions, they have come to a halt. So companies started looking at different ways on to how they can create the digital marketplace. Like say, for example, the automobile industry. Okay, so like say the, the, the uh, Customers, they can't walk down physically to a dealer or a distributor to see the car and have a trial run and so on. But and still they can visit the virtual marketplace and they can have a virtual experience of that particular car. Okay, so this is uh, the many companies, automobile companies, they have come out with this particular technology. And right now we can also see like say how the learning and the training industry has uh, come out with the Zoom platform, the use of Zoom platform, the Microsoft Teams and so on. Okay, so this is basically a reaction that we can't meet physically, but then yes, yes, we can always meet virtually. So this is a basically reactive strategy. Supply chain simulations. Okay, so now the disruption has occurred. We want to look for different ways, like whether this option is going to work, whether option B is going to work, whether option C is going to work, and what are going to be the possible results of these options. Okay, so we have to run a lot of simulations and then see how it is going to work. So like say, for example, if I want to operate only five plants with a limited man force, how much is going to be the productivity? How much is going to be the cost of production? So I want to do all these calculations now. Okay, so this is basically something which the companies are using for reacting it in a particular way. Now, again, we see that supply chain collaboration also repeats itself as a reactive strategy then the use of inventories and the reserve capacity. So this is basically always has been a short term uh, uh, reaction from the many companies to use the inventories and the reserve capacity to react to a particular situation. So basically now that the manufacturing has stopped, we have, if we have inventory, use the inventory, make the sales, okay? So that's what is the reactive strategy. And then the business continuity plans, wherein like say the processes and the systems uh, basically have to work and, uh, we, we look for different ways to which we can make our business run. So basically what the major impact comes, the first impact that comes or it has on the company is that like say when my production has stopped, my services has stopped, my company has, my business has stopped working. In that case, the major crunch that I feel or the major 
implication I have is on the availability of the working capital. Now, how do I manage this working capital? So for this, I would like to see that some of the aspects of my business still start running and then I get some money flow, okay, within my organization. And then uh, the decision making proximity, like how closely you are placed to each other so that quick decisions can be made. Okay, now this is something which is very reactive strategy because uh, we see that the decision makers in a company then they, can, they, they can't come together, they can't take decisions and then virtual medium cannot be always a solution for you to come out with some brainstorming decisions, right? So the companies, they, they, they try to allow uh, working of some executives on the plant, okay, physically, not remotely. So uh, a structural strength or a structural uh, number of people to be allowed coming to the organization so that the quick decisions can be made and decisions can be going fast. Okay, so with this background on the proactive and the reactive strategies, uh, we started our study and uh, this is what the conceptual research framework we had used. So basically we see that there are two components to building the supply chain resilience. So the first component is about the evaluation and the second component is about the strategies. So within which we are going to have the proactive and the reactive strategies and classified as short-term and the long-term strategies. Uh, the methodology used was a three-phase methodology. Okay, so in the first phase, uh, it was basically more on analyzing the supply chain resilience or assessment of the supply chain resilience of the uh, two industries, that's the automobile and the airline. And this assessment was done purely based on the uh, secondary sources of information, the published sources, the numbers coming from this industry. And here we mainly carried out two analysis. The first was time to recovery, because this is what was mentioned as one of the possible ways to measure the resilience of a supply chain. And the financial impact this disruption has had on the different supply chains. In phase two and phase three, we focused on the uh, resilience strategy. In phase two, we identified what are the key short-term resilience strategies that are going to be used by these companies. And over here in this particular stage, we had an empirical survey. So already we had a list of uh, strategies available from the literature and we approached 145 respondents, 88 representing from the automobile companies, the supply chains and 57 from the airline industry. Okay. And uh, over there, we did some analysis to identify the top strategies. In phase three, we had semi-structured interviews. We had uh, meetings with uh, 14 executives, seven from the automobile and seven from the airline industry. And here we had discussions on like, say, what could be their future strategies. Okay, and all put together, all the, the findings of all these three phases helped us to develop our framework, which we refer it as to be the supply chain resilience framework. So you could see that it's a combination of both a qualitative and a quantitative approach. Okay, now this is the first part, the first phase, the supply chain resilience evaluation. Now, this is what we actually studied, the time to recover. So what you could see over here is that a company's normal performance before the disruption is shown by this line over here. The disruption has happened at this particular time, T suffix O, okay? With the disruption, you see the performance of the company is dropping down, okay? Now, it reaches a low. From there, it can follow this path. It can further slip down. From there, it can come up slowly. From here, it can come up quickly. Okay, so if it's going to come up quickly, 
if it's going to recover quickly so this line the line a okay here we call that as a v shaped recovery v shaped recovery okay if it's going to take time okay and b remaining there at the bottom for long and then recovering that is going to be referred as a u shaped recovery okay so we are going to have two types of recoveries v shaped and u shaped okay and then we have something which is just going down going down going down and the company is just going to be out of the business okay so if they are not able to manage the disruption they are out of the business so this is what we would not like to have so again as i told you we did the ttr analysis and we also did the financial impact analysis okay see uh, we used the different uh, data sources uh, for uh, the ttr so we used the production forecast for the automobile industry for the airline industry the uh, the, the forecast of uh, the travel industry the employment impact the production impact in the automobile okay and uh, the tourism impact the cargo impact so we use different uh, sources available to us secondary sources of data okay in the phase 2 as mentioned before we had approached uh, 382 automobile companies so i remind you phase 2 was for measuring the short term resilience strategy it was a survey we approached 145 companies 38% from Uh, the automobile and the remaining from so 60% from the automobile and 40% from the airline industry so there's the profile of the companies we have approached in the second phase so if you could see more interestingly that these companies were representing different parts or different continents we had europe asia and africa in asia we also had india but then the representation was very less maybe only for the airline we had one uh, one one person from air asia and for automobile we had one person representing from mahindra company okay but then most of the representatives were coming from the different parts of asia likewise we had europe we had africa in terms of uh, the size of the companies we had of different sizes okay and also in terms of the supply chain roles like they are performing we had different representations and phase 3 wherein like say we had discussions to understand the long term resilience strategies so these were all the people whom we had approached so seven representing from the uh, airline industry and seven coming from the automobile industry okay now coming to the findings so we did uh, the uh, recovery analysis the time to recover analysis using the information and uh, we we built uh, two scenarios okay we we built the scenarios for u shaped and we also built the scenario for a v shaped recovery so just before this slide i had talked about like say what is meant by u shaped recovery and what is meant by an v shaped recovery now here uh, the results are seen for the automobile industry and then uh, we see for the different uh, continents uh, what has been the impact and we give the projections okay in terms of like say the recovery when it's going to be a v shaped and it's going to be a u shaped and so this is used basically for the ttr analysis and over here we could see the financial impact okay in two situations when in case we are going to have a v shaped and we're going to have a u shaped so as i told you v shaped is a faster recovery and u shaped is a slow recovery and then for the automobile industry what we projected in march uh, may 2020 okay was that if in case we are going to have a u shaped recovery that recovery would be happening by the fourth quarter of 2020 and if it was going to be a v shaped recovery it could happen just at the end of quarter 1 of 2020 okay and now we are in the fourth quarter of 2021 and we saw that the automobile companies they recovered by quarter 2 of 2021 
so our prediction what we had made for this industry was more applicable for a v shaped recovery okay so as per our prediction what we had done the two predictions the automobile industry what we see today has had an v shaped recovery okay and for that what were the strategies okay that we'll have a look at it uh, very soon now this is for the airline industry okay so we used the data and then we just again plotted it for its future uh, based on the forecasting model we deployed uh, based using the second information uh, so again we here derived uh, two situations one was the v shaped and the other one was the u shaped as per the v shaped the airline industry was supposed to recover by quarter 3 of 2021 so compared to the automobile industry it was a slow recovery okay and as per the u shaped okay it could be like say the quarter 4 of 2022 that is one more year and what we could see today is that we are in the fourth quarter of 2021 and still we see that these airline companies have not yet recovered it's going to take time for them so what we see over here based on our analysis is that this industry is not going to follow a v shaped recovery this industry is recover ring slowly and it's going to take more time and then it could be just possible after one more year that is as per our prediction okay we have not updated the information this information is just taken from the um, analysis what we had done in uh, our study in may 2020 and still it is valid okay that's what i can say and we are happy to uh, showcase this particular finding uh, to the world that okay that it's going to be still time for the airline industry and it's going to be slow okay so this is uh, coming from our analysis the survey what we had uh, done and we had approached uh, in the survey uh, the practitioners from both the automobile and the airline industry and this is what they mentioned so working capital impact was reported very high by the airline companies or the supply chains okay followed by the sales impact and the overall impact if you see that the overall impact is of all these four factors that's the supply chain manufacturing service shutdown working capital and then the sales okay so the overall impact what we could see is was more for the service industry as compared to the manufacturing industry but then the difference is not much is 4.56 and 4.78 on a scale of 5 uh so working capital was seen or reported as a major factor when it comes to the airline and when it comes to the manufacturing sector it is the shutdowns what has impacted them very badly okay and in terms of the supply chain disruptions the manufacturing supply chains they have reported a high disruption as compared to the airline supply chain okay so these are the uh, various uh, response strategies now what could be of interest to us is uh, the differences in the opinion of the airline and the automobile companies so first we could see the rank so the highest for the airline industry what we could see in terms of their response strategy what they have deployed is 4.20 and that is business continuity plans so basically they want to see to that how they can keep their aircraft flying okay so that was the main concern and that was the main strategy and that was done with help of the governments okay with help of the air bubbles okay so they could put pressure on the government and they could see to it that like say their flights are allowed to fly with reduced number or with reduced capacity uh the highest in the automobile industry was the big data driven and the real time information system so many of these uh, automobile companies they started investing heavily on the big data driven and the real time information as well as the strategy involved localization of the ecosystem that is supply selection who are going to be based locally use of the industry for technologies like big data again like iot and so on okay so that is what was the response 
the top response strategies of an automobile company or supply chain. And for the airline, the top was again big data. And it was creation of the virtual marketplaces and the business continuity plans. So focus on supply chain focus, so social, social supply chain focus was also rated on a higher side. So these are the priority. And these were the key strategies that were used by these companies. We used uh, the string approaches to see how these companies are prepared to implement these strategies. And then we could classify these companies into three categories. So the companies which were well prepared, companies which were partially prepared, and the companies which were ill prepared. Okay, so that was the classification we could do with the available data with us. Similarly, we did it for the airline industry. Okay, and then sharing the results of the long-term strategy. So one was about uh, the digital driven data analysis capabilities, human awareness. So this is the results coming from the quality to study or the interactions with the experts, the practitioners. As I mentioned that we had approached seven experts from the automobile companies and seven experts from the airline supply chains. And then these were the identified long-term strategies. Okay, so the long-term strategy included digital driven data analytics capabilities. So the companies wanted to develop that for the future. And here we could see what was the explanation for basically suggesting this strategy. So they wanted to bring in an awareness in the staff about how COVID can impact. So basically they want they, they said that okay it could be the digital data driven capabilities development human awareness okay developing the lifeline and the transportation system implementing the emerging technologies getting in the supply chain collaboration okay so these were the reactive strategies and here we have the proactive strategies that's in for the long term companies would like to go for the digital transformation because we could see that many of the companies they were operating the traditional way the conventional way but now they would like to use the digital capabilities and go for a major change they want to transform themselves okay then the integrated risk management facilities basically they want to work as a team now not separate it at different locations and then basically the Final one, the social supply chain focus. That's about the corporate social responsibility. Okay, so just to sum it up. So this is about the supply chain evaluation and awareness creation capabilities the companies would like to develop. This is the long-term reactive response strategies. And this is the proactive long-term strategies. Okay. And then finally, based on our study, this is what the model which we have proposed for the industry. That's both the automobile and the airline. And this can be generalized across all the manufacturing sector and the service sector as a representation. Okay, so for you to manage a supply chain disruption successfully, you have to first perform your own analysis. Okay, how well prepared you are, whether you are partially prepared or you are ill prepared. Right? Then you have to classify and you have to select your strategies in two forms the proactive strategies and the reactive strategies. And over here, when I talk about the proactive strategies and the reactive strategies, this could be of two types. It could be short term and it could be long term. Like say, for example, digital transformation is going to take a lot of time. It's not just going to happen quickly. 
okay it's going to take years so that is a long term strategy whereas selecting the local suppliers that could be the company starting very quickly immediately okay supply chain collaboration initiatives the companies can immediately start so we have proactive we have reactive strategies within that we are going to have short term we are going to have the long term so you have to select the appropriate strategies okay so first analyze your capabilities your present standing in terms of your preparations decide on the proactive and the reactive strategies both the short term and the long term and then also see to that like say what level of capabilities okay and what level of human awareness is going to be in place because that's going to be supporting for you to implement this proactive and reactive strategies okay and uh, this framework as i told you can be generalized for all the industries which can be categorized into the manufacturing as well as the service as seen from this particular chart now uh, some 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 um, recommendations uh, or the points which can be suggested to the industry experts based on our study coming from our analysis so basically we have to have an inside outside approach so basically inside out approach or the control mechanisms so basically it's nothing but it all starts on how well you are prepared and how well the capabilities you possess okay so it's basically how strong you are so basically inside out in a sense like say you have to be prepared first to deal out to deal with the outside disruptions online transactions and engagement so basically how these supply chains can develop a place for online transactions and engagements like say for example we have seen the remote service apartments in the automobile industry right Uh, when it comes to the airline travel now we see that there's a lot of checks happenings okay and then most of these checks now is happening online like checking of your covid uh, vaccination status or the pcr reports and so on okay so it's very important for the companies to build some platforms okay on wherein like say many of the activities can be taken online uh, then we have the green agenda and the loan guarantee so basically many countries like say for example france okay they have started offering loans to the uh, companies uh, or the supply chains which has been badly impacted right but then when they're giving the loans they are also pushing the green agenda like say for example when uh, the france government has given loan to air france and klm they have put in a condition like say uh, what initiatives or they have listed down the initiatives like on to using the greener fuels and uh, reducing the number of flights in future so that they have uh, less carbon footprints and so on the china government policy so it's very popular and uh, what they have done is that when the manufacturing companies were shut down when they were not producing china focused on supporting these automobile companies in building their capability in the battery driven vehicles okay and then in 19 that is in 2019 2020 and 2021 china has mainly focused on shifting or maybe building its capacity on producing the battery operated vehicles and now we see that china has taken the advantage of this last 3 years closure last 2 years closure and they are maybe now the uh, one of the market leader in terms of uh, the, the the number of production uh, market leader in terms of the production of the vehicles the battery operated vehicles the government can push the banks on to cutting the interest rates for the loans being given to different industries companies and international travel is something which uh, has to be there and uh, already we see that many companies many countries they have signed the air bubble agreements and they're trying to push the international travel and maybe india was supposed to open the international travel from 15th yeah. of december but then we could see that it has not yeah. happened okay because of this new threat of omicron and it has been pushed another unless unless okay
okay so uh, this is what i wanted to present to you yeah, and uh, 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 basically has provided to you an overview of like say how the supply chain resilience can be measured and uh, what were the different uh, supply chain resilience uh, strategies uh, in the short term and in the long term and how it could be classified as reactive and how it could be classified as proactive okay so with this uh, i come to an closure of this presentation and uh, I, I i make the platform open for questions if any thank you so much sir for that insightful address uh, the research paper that you shared with us was indeed very elaborate and informative now uh, i'll be sharing some questions with you that we got from the audience yeah please the first uh, question that we got is that as you mentioned about the resilience from covid what are your thoughts about the industries uh, about the uh, industries learning from this situation to become elastic to such conditions if uh, ever they occur again so what are your thoughts uh, on this it's, it's always going to be a learning and uh, no company can become elastic uh, like say it, it's going it's not going to be like say rigid okay so this type of disruptions are going to be coming and it's going to be affecting the supply chains in different forms okay Uh, right now, uh, the supply chains has been affected because of uh, the new policies, the new norms which has uh, come out because of this uh, COVID-19. Okay, because uh, that includes uh, uh, the closures, uh, that includes like say the uh, lockdowns and uh, the sanitary measures and so on. But uh, the new disruptions are going to bring in new types of challenges. Okay, and uh, the new types of challenges are going to give rise to new type of solutions. so right now the study what has focused or maybe uh, whatever the resilience strategies what we have seen they have emerged out uh, with reference to the company's uh, uh, reactions uh, or be uh, to become proactive to a certain class of threats that's being posed by covid-19 now when something new disruption is going to happen in future we don't know whether this strategy is going to work or not but then as with the improving technology with the new technology innovations uh, there are going to be always some new solutions coming up in the future i ho hope i am i am able to un uh, answer this question uh, uh, yes sir you explained it really well now prabhat will be taking up the second question so uh, the audience wanted to know about uh, did the risk sharing across supply chain increase drastically after covid 19 so what yeah the risk sharing across supply chain uh, has uh, improved actually okay so it's changing and it's going to take time because it's one of the long term strategy now what happens is that like say when we talk about any supply chain the supply chain is too scattered and there are many partners okay like say for example if we just take uh, the supply chain of an automobile okay now uh, we just talk about like say uh, the different parts of a supply chain sorry uh, the different components that goes into an automobile okay there are going to be more than uh, 3000 parts that goes into a car okay and then it means that we're going to be having more than 3000 suppliers coming on uh, with the company okay and uh, again it depends on the present strategy of the company whether they have a single sourcing strategy or they have a dual or a multiple sourcing strategy for that particular part or component now this increases the complexity of the supply chain and uh, bringing in the risk management across uh, integrated risk management or sharing across all these partners at present is just not going to be happening very quickly the companies has to be doing that in the phases and the companies have already started doing that uh, but that's going to take time uh, so first the companies has to decide whether it's just the risk sharing across a few selected suppliers or the key suppliers or it's going to be across all the suppliers now that that encourages the use of uh, blockchain technology okay wherein let's like, say a blockchain if implemented across the supply chains in that case it's because of the cost aspects uh, and also because of the number of partners that could be put on a blockchain it is it has it, it has to be having a restriction on it okay so when a company is going to think about implementing a blockchain okay that uh, risk sharing across the supply chains is going to be automatically going to be putting in place okay so but that that's going to be taking time and uh, these measures are going to be very costly okay so maybe the small ancillaries uh, who are there on the supply chain uh, as a suppliers for the big companies uh, they may not offer to be uh, coming on through this particular platform so that's also going to be remaining a big challenge for these companies 
thank you so much sir so uh, due to time crunch we will not be able to take any more questions so we had two eminent speakers on supply chain risk and disruptions while mr rohit but focused on risk from the practitioner viewpoint uh, sachin sir spoke about proactive and reactive strategies for supply chain disruptions from an academic perspective it was indeed fascinating to understand the framework modeling techniques and the resultant conclusions of the study thank you professor sachin uh, for taking thank time you. out of your busy schedule to address us and uh, as a token of gratitude we would like to present you with a memento uh, which will be delivered to you very soon sir thank you thank, thank you, you very you. much thank you sir thank you uh, when it comes to an all round holistic growth and understanding the current corporate scenario it is best to learn from the people who are already accustomed to it it is crucial for anyone to gather as much information about the current trends as one can understand the current state of the industry and experience how professionals come up with modern day solutions to improve their processes to facilitate this we have with us today mr vasan mugada who is a senior director at gp and mr sandeep chatterjee who is a director at deloitte mr vasan is a seasoned procurement and supply chain management professional He has been delivering sustainable cost savings and process improvements across industries over his 10 plus years of experience under various roles in GEP. He received his MBA from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. His areas of expertise include procurement transformation, change management and strategic sourcing. He has contributed to several large scale supply chain and operation consulting engage- engagements and has successfully impacted his clients. through tens of millions in savings resulting from process improvements we are delighted to host you sir we would now like to pass the baton to mr vasan mugada to share his enlightening words with the audience on the topic a period dominated by uncertainties and rapid transformations over to you sir perfect uh, thank you very much team i hope i am audible yes sir, yes, sir absolutely right thank you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction uh, truly appreciate it and um, i would also want to thank the whole team uh, for this opportunity i was listening into professor uh, sachin kamble's uh, presentation it was very insightful and actually it talks a lot about um, you know what we are seeing and uh, those are pretty much in line with possibly a lot of stuff which you'll see during my presentation as well um but um i'll take you through um some of the uncertainties which we are facing both on the procurement and supply chain space and what can be done i think that was one of the questions which was posted and uh, we can do a bit more deep dive into it so having said that i'll just possibly just go ahead and present my screen uh, please uh, allow me a minute Okay, shared the wrong one. Yeah. Please let me know once you're able to see my screen. Yes, sir. We are able to see the screen. Perfect. Thank you very much. Just put it on full screen. Perfect. So. yeah uh, thank you for that introduction once again um and um, just to add to what tanya mentioned uh, as a part of the introduction uh, i joined gp in 2010 uh, after my mba and prior to mba i had uh, about 3 years of experience with infosys um in the it space um, and it and supply chain space um and post that i joined gp uh, as a senior consultant and over the years um um uh, i grew along with the company uh, and uh, uh, i'm now a senior director in the consulting function uh, i work with over 35 odd clients across the globe 
pretty much worked across all the geographies across the globe. Um, and uh, the key industries which I've been associated with are um, life sciences, CPG, retail, and manufacturing. So these are the ones uh, which I've had uh, my experience in. And some of those uh, slides which we'll talk about will, will also uh, kind of focus on those. And um, I started uh, my journey in the procurement space. And uh, over the course of uh, these years, we've slowly, GP has also expanded into the supply chain space. So I've sort of joined um, you know, the expansion spree and uh, also worked on multiple clients in, this, uh, in the supply chain space. And that's what we wanted to bring to the forefront here as to uh, what are those uh, uncertainties and how do we look at uh, mitigating some of the risks or at least proactively identifying those risks and planning for them. So that's what we will talk about during this um, next 20, 25 minutes. Um, so I'll quickly take you through um, GEP. Uh, so we, GEP was formed in the year 1999. Uh, the full uh, form or uh, GEP stands for Global E-Procure. So we started as a procurement company. And uh, over the years, we uh, also grew into the supply chain space. And today, we are one of the global leaders in the uh, procurement and supply chain space. Uh, we are named by several um, leading analysts in the industry, uh, be it the Gartners or the Foresters, so on and so forth. Um, 5,500 plus employees, 24 offices, our headquarters is in Clark, New Jersey. Uh, and then the other next big um, uh, location from a people standpoint is in uh, Mumbai, uh, which is in India. Um, and uh, over 500 plus customers, most of these are Fortune 500, Global 2000, several of them are Fortune 50. So there were Fortune 10 companies as well, which we work with. Um, in terms of some of the service offerings, um, we provide consulting services, that is the strategy related portion. And then we also have our own in-house software, which is GEP Next and GEP um, Smart. And then we offer managed services to several of our clients in the space of supply chain and procurement. We work across all the dimensions, uh, that is plan, procure, make and deliver. Uh, and um, off late, and you'll see a lot of this in the following slides as well. There is a lot of emphasis on digital led transformation, uh, as Professor uh, uh, Kamle was saying, um, reducing costs, improving business agility and resilience, uh, focus on EBITDA. There's a lot of uncertainty today. Uh, focusing on cash flow, there was a certain point where uh, there were cash flow crunches, people are looking for um, uh, identifying, you know, how to mitigate that particular risk, um, optimizing working capital, and uh, also focusing on gaining com competitive advantage. So those are the things uh, which you know we focus on from a service offering standpoint, and uh, we've worked with several companies um, on a day in day out basis. And this particular presentation will be a mix of, you know, our understanding uh, based on our uh, current working with most of these companies. So jumping into um, uh, the topic for today, which is a period dominated by uncertainties and rapid transformations. What we are seeing is um, the COVID-19 pandemic at least has tested all of us on all possible fronts, right? So uh, when the uh, lockdowns were uh, being imposed, there was a huge round of uncertainty around the business continuity, what would be the BCP, com companies were running around developing those BCPs um, around uh, people working from home, so on and so forth. Uh, but we being human beings, we were quickly able to transform, businesses were uh, quickly transforming and so were the governments as well to adapt to this new normal. Um, what we see is, a lot of the uncertainties were, uh, which we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we also foresee those to exist in the future, be it the short term, medium term, and the long term. And it is for us uh, to ensure that we are able to 
see what sort of uh, challenges are coming and uh, adapt to those changes uh, accordingly. So currently, some of the things which we are seeing, uh, a very, very volatile labor market, right? So there was a period where um, um, in, in the labor market, um, there was a shortage uh, in terms of talent uh, prior to the pandemic. And then uh, during the pandemic, um, people were, we were not able to find people because of the pandemic. Uh, business continuities, we, we had to bring in more people, so on and so forth. And right now, there is a new challenge altogether. We are talking about the great resignation. Uh, so businesses are facing um, increased cost pressures because of this, and that we are seeing across the board. Um, so that is with the volatile labor market. We are also seeing several uh, risks from a geopolitical standpoint uh, uh, across the globe, across geographies, Professor uh, Kamble was talking about this uh, in pretty pretty much of a detail. Uh, environmental disasters, uh, we are seeing them more and more coming in. Um, and uh, a lot of the companies are uh, looking to contribute uh, to mitigate a lot of these disasters or work towards a better, uh, uh, greener uh, uh, globe going forward. Um, so that is also one of the pieces which will come into for, um, forefront very, very quickly in the near future. So um, uh, this is a quick overview of um, a report which we uh, worked along with um, the economist. Um, the survey was conducted by the economist. And um, as a part of this, uh, about 400 plus uh, CXOs and uh, directors uh, in the supply chain and procurement organizations were interviewed and uh, we wanted to understand, you know, what are those key challenges and key issues which they're facing. Uh, some of the key industries which, which was a focus area were agriculture, industrial automotive, uh, CPG retail, chemicals, aerospace, healthcare, so on and so forth. So, what we understood uh, as a part of this was uh, more than half of the executives reported that their supply chains did get disrupted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was not just because of um, uh, the new ways of working, but there were several new threats as well, that is cyber attacks, commodity price fluctuations, uh, regulations were changing, and even today we are facing that uh, when we are developing procurement strategies, new supply chain strategies for companies in terms of sourcing their raw materials or uh, from the tier one, tier two suppliers across the globe, right? So these things are continuing to be there as a challenge and uh, these will continue to be there in the future as well. Over 64% of the companies reported uh, revenue losses uh, between six to 20%. That's a very, very big number for multiple clients in the year 2020. And uh, there were damages to the company brand reputations um, and uh, that led to increased cost of operations. And uh, I think you've, you've heard this several, several times now, uh, but companies started focusing on developing redundancy and uh, resilience uh, is a key focus area. Then um, focusing on speed and efficiency, right? So we used to talk about um, just in time, right, uh, in the past. And now it is all about just in case. But these are two opposite dimensions uh, from a spectrum, right? So just in time uh, is more around minimizing your inventory, uh, your uh, working capital related expenses, versus just in case is the other extreme where you have a lot of inventory and a lot of working capital, but you are able to respond back to um, the, uh, the customer requirements uh, very, very quickly. So uh, a classic example uh, of this would be when the pandemic hit, uh, there was a huge requirement uh, from all the FMCGs to ensure that sanitizers would be there on the uh, uh, on your um, uh, on the shop, right? Uh, when you go to a shop, uh, you should be able to see sanitizers. So the supply chain had to quickly uh, sort of change and ensure that, uh, that there is a sanitizer available 
in any uh, retail store which you go to. Uh, if it is not the case, then that is loss of revenue for them. So they had to quickly adapt uh, to that particular change. And say, so is the case with several other companies. At the same time, customer preferences are changing. Uh, so you'll also need to focus on that. Uh, uh, historically, for any new product introduction which used to happen, uh, it, uh, the time to uh, introduce a new product was anywhere between six to nine months or so. And of around 12 to 15 new products which you would introduce, one or two would survive at the end of 18 months, <clears throat> 18 to 24 months. So that entire period has come down. So the, there is a rapid need for innovation. And at the same time, um, that success of those new products is also lower now because the customer preferences have, are changing uh, because of the new ways of working. <clears throat> so these supply chain disruptions are uh, expected to continue. Uh, there is no looking back and we need to uh, start focusing on how will this sort of new future be. So all the companies, all the CEOs, CXOs, you, you read through them in the papers. Those are the things which come uh, when we talk to several of these CXOs uh, on almost on a daily basis. How do you ensure <clears throat> that uh, we are able to look at these disruptions? So a um, few quick things about uh, these disruptions, right? So just because we had to adapt to this new normal, uh, we looked at some of the key challenges and came up with very quick, short-term, quick solutions, right? So those were more like the quick fixes, but then in the long run, uh, these were opportunities to fundamentally change the way uh, in which a business would work. So uh, in terms of the challenges, we've uh, discussed some of these, uh, but the big ones are sort of the lack of visibility, right? So your parts um, or the raw materials uh, availability uh, to, to the manufacturer, that is the tier one, tier two suppliers, so in some cases tier three supplier uh, visibility, uh, lack of collaboration within the functions, within the businesses. Again, uh, it used to be pretty much uh, focused on my particular function, my particular ways of working, um, how much should I collaborate, so on and so forth. Um, there is a huge shift in market dynamics, uh, which we were talking before, and uh, there was uh, an impact in the cash flow, which continues to be the case even today. And uh, massive dis disruptions across the value chain, right? So when you're working with contract manufacturers and companies, suppliers, they're shutting down, contract manufacturers shutting down, uh, not able to sustain, so on and so forth. So sudden changes in the space, and then m as which are very prevalent in this space right now, as companies are shutting down or um, applying for bankruptcies, m as are taking place uh, in the market. And then you may or may not be able to work with that particular supplier once an m a happens. So there is a new level of uncertainty which comes into picture. So some of the quick solutions, at least what we've worked with some of our clients is uh, to see how they can invest in new capabilities. We're seeing this across the globe today. A lot of the companies which um, had their digital roadmaps for the next four to five years, right? Whatever they had in their digital roadmap for the next four to five years, they brought it in almost uh, uh, four or five years ahead. Uh, and they are starting to implement it. They see a lot of value in developing that visibility um, in, the, uh, in the supply chain space. So they are investing in uh, the digital space. Um, again, this is the results for the results to start hitting, it will take a bit of time. Uh, it's not something which is a switch, right, uh, which you can switch on and you'll be able to get it. But at least there are some low hanging fruits which you'll be able to get. Those are, say, the proactive, uh, the predictive and uh, uh, proactive related analytics, digital analytics, uh, digitization of a lot of the data which they have, so on and so forth, which we uh, pretty much see in this particular space. Um, improving and streamlining the execution of workflow. So we work with several of our clients to redevelop, uh, relook at their overall processes, uh, make them ready for the next uh, frontier, right? So when they digitize it, are they ready for that? Like, do they have the right level of uh, data? Do they have the right, right level of tools um, for a next maybe six months or one year uh, digitalization journey, right? 
um, and build a lot of self-service business uh, process, right? Um, so this is something we worked as quick solutions. But what it also led is we were able to develop these long-term opportunities for clients. And we told them that, you know, there is a fundamental need to change the way you are operating today. So talk about the quick fixes, right? So a lot of it, people used to source from uh, APAC in the past. Uh, we see that today in the, in the freight market, uh, we were just talking about it in the past session, uh, freight from China, right? Um, and uh, some of the APAC regions, it has gone up by about like 40 to 80% in some of the cases uh, because of shortages or shutdowns, uh, so on and so forth. So there is a fundamental need and several companies have started investing in um, uh, near shoring, uh, having uh, warehouses closer to the end customers. Uh, it's not across the board. Uh, some of the companies have started to look at alternative manufacturing locations, alternative warehousing locations uh, to ensure that they are able to take care of these or mitigate these risks. So there is a fundamental change in the operating model. Um, again, by industry, be it the healthcare, be it um, uh, retail, CPG, so on and so forth. Every industry has a different way to look at it here. Uh, prioritizing on people. Uh, we are talking about... Uh, 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 great resignations right now. Uh, uh, people are working hard. There's a lot of stress which is happening, uh, which people are not going to through right now. Supplier engagement, again, is a very big area. Uh, supplier risk assessment, risk management was a big, big focus area. Even prior to the uh, pandemic, we were working with several clients in the past, but this is all the more important because uh, of the current dynamics. Suppliers are uh, applying for bankruptcy, um, um, so we are um, seeing a lot of uncertainty because suppliers are not able to predict their raw material prices in the right way. So they are facing a lot of risks. Um, they're not able to manage the margins which they have. Like historically, if a supplier would have uh, through a should costing exercise, right? Like we ascertain that a supplier has about 12 to 15% margin um, because of the raw material price increases uh, or labor prices or some of these um, other uh, costs which are there uh, in the whole dynamics. If the supplier is not able to work through their cost uh, costing in the right way, there is a big challenge. Uh, they're, they're going ahead and um, applying for post major clauses. They're not able to manage the prices better. So it um, we've we've worked with several clients where we are partnering with the suppliers to ensure that they're not getting into that space and companies are investing with them. So enhanced supplier management, working uh, with them together, providing them that intelligence, if they don't have it, is, is also becoming very important. Innovating with purpose, um, uh, again, co-innovation with the suppliers, being ready for the future, identifying what are the key big themes, and uh, definitely unlocking funds is, is, is a big uh, focus area. So these are some of the big long-term opportunities which we've seen uh, and worked through. Um, So just uh, looking, uh, we've, we've discussed about this. I'll not, you know, I'll allow you guys to go through this uh, slide and read it. But um, what we're talking about is there are, there are demand disruptions. Uh, there's an increased volatility. Um, manufacturing distribution center closes, uh, closures we're seeing, raw material shortages, supplier shutdowns, we're seeing them. So how, what, what are companies doing right now, right? So this is something which most of the companies are already doing or some of the companies are working uh, towards it, right? So resilience um, and uh, achieving a balance between short-term and long-term goals is, is very important. There's a very classic example which we keep uh, citing or we keep hearing. Uh, there are two companies, say a company A and a company B, and company A used to do very, very well uh, pre-pandemic. Um, JIT processes, very solid uh, quarter on quarter growth, uh, established uh, supplier relationships, um, preferred suppliers, uh, very solid processes, so on and so forth. And then there is a company B, which was sort of fluctuating, more working as uh, the businesses see, uh, saw their future, they used to focus on the shorter term uh, changes and focus on a much broader vision for say. 
And during the pandemic, we saw a shift, a big shift um, in, in this. Company A was not able to live with the same set of process. They were running Haywire, uh, trying to uh, transform their uh, the procurement process, the supply chain transformation. They went through a supply chain transformation engagement and tried to identify, you know, tell me what are those five things which are really important for me right now, right, uh, in, in all these areas. So uh, we worked with several of these companies to identify, you know, what is that right balance for us in the next three months, six months, and then reconfigure that, re-evaluate that in the near short term. Uh, so company B, uh, interestingly, was operating very well during the pandemic. Um, they were able to uh, respond back very well uh, to the overall pandemic, uh, uh, be it the uh, resilience, be it um, the capacities which they had, um, be it the redundancies which they had built into their uh, uh, whole supply chain, they were able to respond back very well. So um, what does the future of um, the supply chain look like, right? So this, this is something which, um, um, again, is, is, is a big balance, which a lot of the companies are doing right now. Uh, however, before investing a lot of money, a lot of the companies are really, really cautious about, you know, tell me what exactly is the short term, medium term, and long term. We simply cannot switch to a high redundancy model just because you know something is going on right now. Uh, versus, you cannot be very lean as well. So, tell me what is that right balance, right? So, removing cost versus ensuring customer value. So, there is a very subtle balance, and it it is pretty much dependent on the core um, mission of that particular company on how they want to work in the future, right? So uh, the first aspect of it is definitely uh, building that resilience and being responsible uh, from a supply chain standpoint. What we've seen is uh, several companies have built that resilience. They've built several risk, uh, uh, proactive risk indicating uh, uh, tools, um, invested heavily into uh, digital technologies, uh, be it uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning related stuff, to be able to tell them or indicate you know, how uh, and what sort of uh, risks are coming up uh, and uh, to be able to, I would, I would not say you'll be able to manage every possible risk, but at least know that there are certain risks which are coming up and prioritize which of these risks should I really focus on uh, without which I cannot live. So those are the things which um, um, are, are there. Um, and uh, right now there is a huge focus on prioritizing redundancy or resilience and speed. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, there is a focus on um, improving redundancy uh, uh, and resilience. Historically, it used to be speed. Um, right now, if there is, if the if a product is not there on the shelf, um, then customers would switch away to a different brand. That, that's the CPG world. Um, in the pharma world, you need to have a product. Um, it will cost. Uh, uh, several lives, again, if you're not able to respond back uh, in time. And building transparency, this is, again, a very, very big factor what we see today. Um, people need to know how you're collaborating with the tier one, tier two suppliers, how um, I, is your supply chain going uh, uh, into your customers, right? So your um, primary distribution, secondary distribution, uh, how is that particular flow? How is your customer segment changing? What is What are you uh, getting in from there? How are you able to feed it back uh, to your, um, you know, your suppliers? And how are you able to innovate better? So on and so forth. So that transparency is, again, very important. And uh, there is a big, big need today of what we are seeing. Uh, historically, uh, there used to be a set of suppliers you used to partner with. Uh, right now, there is a larger pool of preferred suppliers, um, better uh, supplier collaboration workshops, uh, trying to understand um, how do you engage with suppliers better from an innovation perspective? How, how can they contribute? How can you help them uh, you know, grow uh, in whatever aspects and dimensions it is possible? So there is a better need for that exchange of information within the, with the suppliers. 
there is a big focus on efficient cost management. Again, cost is a big area because you're, you're talking about uh, uh, redundancy. So cost, obviously, you'll need to monitor very closely how much is the cost impact. Um, so focusing on all the resources, trying to identify which are the high value ones, uh, high value spend categories, what will be the impact on them? How can you mitigate some of the cost increases? Uh, or how, how do you continue with it? How long will you need to continue, right? So those are the things which are important. Um, having an optimized procurement process, supply chain um, processes, uh, be it inventory, uh, planning, ordering, uh, and how do you also focus on digitalization, analytics adoption? I think most of the companies today, like 99% um, of the companies have invested in digitalization over the past you know, three years. And in more in the recent years, we've worked with several of them uh, on this particular journey and in the analytics space, helping them proactively identify you know, uh, um, what are the risks, how do you identify the trends which are coming up in the future by commodity, by category, uh, in the space of um, inventory, so on and so forth. And also enabling growth, right? So by participating or helping uh, suppliers, uh, and working with them collaboratively to track um, uh, inputs from them and uh, providing predictive uh, risk intelligence based on suppliers. Um, actionable market insights, right? So this is again, very important for a procurement professional. Um, <clears throat> earlier or this quarter, when we were doing uh, the planning for several clients, uh, there, was, uh, there were several indicators which we had um, internally uh, where uh, the freight prices, the road freight prices were, uh, we were seeing an uptick in the freight prices. We were working with many, very many clients to talk to them and move out some of the uh, procurement uh, related contract renewal related discussions with them uh, in the logistics space to say Q3, Q4 of next year, uh, just through these real time actionable market insights. Right? So it's not just about Pricing uh, again. These prices, uh, these pricing models are very complex models. Uh, go across multiple multiple dimensions, but uh, we were able to uh, work through them, bring in uh, feeds from the qualitative factors, social factors, so on and so forth, and build these um, actionable market insights. And again, these insights change by category. By category, what we mean is logistics, IT as a category, MRO, uh, which is maintenance repair, be it capital purchases. Again, capital also, a lot of the um, aluminum prices, so you name those uh, raw material prices, they are also going up. So we've been able to build those and take them into consideration. Um, focus on flexible, agile operating model and uh, create an ecosystem of partners, again, from a supplier standpoint. So that is the balance, and it is, again, a continuously evolving one. Uh, a lot of the CEOs, CXO level people are very, very closely monitoring this almost on a very frequent basis these days. Like, what is that balance happening or how is it today? Um, a very quick use case of it, I'll not get into it. I know I'm running out of time, but uh, what I'll do is I'll tell you a specific use case about COGS, uh, how companies are uh, trying to improve or focus on better COGS, uh, the cost of goods sold. So through uh, advanced analytics and real-time market intelligence, some of the factors uh, which I was talking about, using AI, ML, <clears throat> short costing tools, um, uh, predictive forecasting, uh, market intelligence, value engineering, and uh, focusing on outcome-based engagements, we are able to uh, quickly respond to global arbitrage, like where should you source your uh, materials from? Should you source it from China, US and China, because of the trade war, uh, there's a huge, uh, uh, import duty, which is there. Um, so where else can you look at how else or are there any alternatives or you'll need to continue with it? How is it a short term thing? Is it a long term thing? What are the key um, factors which go into it? That's just an example. I mean, there's several such examples which are there. Should I focus on the APAC centric model to a Europe centric model or an India centric model? Uh, how, wh 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 where else should I have my you know manufacturing process? Uh, pricing constructs like um, allowing raw materials uh, the suppliers to shield themselves from any raw material price fluctuations is again important uh, and uh, focus on uh, choosing the right 
materials and services to identify the best business outcomes, right? Uh, collaborating with the suppliers and trying to remove that risk of uncertainty with them, like partnering with them is again an important one. So um, that brings me to the uh, end of my presentation. I'll, I'll share some uh, uh, case studies on this, uh, on this particular slide, but I'll not go into this. Uh, and I'm open to any questions which may be there. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on the topic, sir. It was very insightful and I hope it gave a holistic overview of how companies need to work on their supply chains uh, to be more sustainable. Now we have a few questions with us, uh, which I'll be directing towards you. So the first question is, how does GEP ensure that they stay relevant to the market trends, considering it is a consulting firm? This, this is an excellent uh, question. Uh, in terms of us, uh, from a market perspective, uh, there are multiple aspects which go into it. Uh, one of the key aspects is um, supplier uh, working together with suppliers, right? Like you'll know the core pulse uh, from an industry perspective. From a technology perspective, uh, what we understand through our discussions with um, CXO level people is what are the key problem statements which they are looking at. We do these surveys um, of CXO level um, members trying to understand what are the key problem statements which they are looking at. Uh, how do they prioritize this? What are the short term, medium term, long term focus areas? And there is a core group of uh, subject matter experts uh, which are there uh, within the company. So through a collaboration across all these areas from the clients, uh, from the suppliers whom we talk to on a, almost on a day in day out basis, um, and uh, also internally through the SME network, we try to make sure that we are preparing for the next new norm. Um, in the procurement space, we've been there for quite some time. We know uh, process in and out. Uh, we've worked with companies, even in the supply chain space, right? Uh, we work with companies, even in the, uh, you, you call it the sinusoidal curve, right? So at the top, uh, when companies are really doing well versus when companies are not doing well, we've had those um, solutions developed, tailored to them. So there are certain nuances which we bring in from our uh, historical practice as well and try to build solutions which are very customizable and um, specific to clients. So it's like a combination of multiple factors which go into it. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, this is something we uh, we try to look at on an ongoing basis, trying to identify these problems and help uh, clients. Yes, sir, it definitely did answer my question. So uh, due to time crunch, we'll have to limit ourselves to uh, this much or uh, this number of questions. So uh, now uh, we learned that GEP is doing a pioneering work in helping enterprises to operate and optimize their supply chains. We learned in depth about the impact of COVID uh, on supply chains mm -hmm. and how organizations can collaborate and integrate their suppliers. Thank you, Vasan, sir, for the in interesting talk. And as a token of thanks, we would like to present you with a memento, uh, which will be delivered to you very soon. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure uh, speaking with all of you this uh, morning. Likewise, and uh, I wish you all the very best. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next speaker of this segment, we would like to introduce Mr. Sandeep Chatterjee. Mr. Sandeep is a director with Deloitte, leading the supply chain and emerging technologies practice. He holds an MBA from IIM Kori Kod and Bachelor in Engineering from IIEST Shippur. Previously, he had worked with KPMG, Oracle, Infosys, and Tata Motors. Currently, he holds the position of the Chairman and CEO of International Supply Chain Education Alliance, India, and Member of Board of Governors, I am Kori Kod. The audience is eager to know your thoughts on Supply Chain 4.2, sir. The stage is all yours. So, uh, good morning. And uh, thank you again uh, for inviting me again. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. So, again, uh, I'm not using the background which I suggested. I would have loved to, but I thought that maybe I will go ahead with this. Uh, so hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, sir. We can hear you yeah. clearly. Okay, perfect. So let me just go ahead and share my screen.
so over the next uh, half an hour or so uh, we we'll talk about uh, digital supply chain uh, so given my background uh, again this is a disclaimer again i have nothing to hide or nothing to do uh, but typically what happens is a lot of you will be making uh, presentations uh, in the media and there are chances of you getting misquoted so that's why it's a good practice to actually uh, put this disclaimer because it saves you and it saves also your company so i have a very very structured presentation uh, given on a background because if you look at it uh, consulting thrives wherever there is ambiguity so when you say gst came in you could see a whole lot of uh, consulting firms thriving because there was ambiguity so companies look for us uh, to help them navigate through this so what whenever you see that it's always uh the consultants they try to give a structure because the moment you structure your problem the solutioning also becomes quite easy so i will go ahead and introduce the topic what we are going to talk about today then i will talk about how uh, supply chain has changed over the years and then we we'll talk something around disruption and digitization which is where the crux of all this is happening because and i think uh, unfortunately we had to had a have a pandemic to show it to us uh, because uh, people were thinking about uh, digitalizing but a lot of these got accelerated because the kind of things which you have seen in the in this two years have not seen in the last 10 years so maybe unfortunate event which unfolded a lot of things but there's always a silver lining at the end of uh, every catastrophe then again uh, we talk about some real life examples because that's important because what i will talk is theory but if you don't know if you really don't appreciate where and how it will apply it really doesn't make sense and finally i leave it with the uh, supply chain 2025 because that's because typically we are so used to designing things for today and it's always good to take a futuristic view because if you look at our road systems or the railway systems we are in trouble because we never thought through but if you compare it with us they have one of the best road systems in the world because they thought through 20 years ago in advance that this is going to be the population and that's why they got into an eight lane and and what we are doing is simply catching up it's always good to take a futuristic approach i know this pandemic has forced us more uncertainty but uncertainty and risk was always there only thing is now that we are taking it very seriously but we still need to have a starting point because unless we take some future view life doesn't move. so moving on let me just introduce it now if you look at how 1980 used to work it was more of a seller's market there was stable demand so i remember when i went to buy a bajaj scooter uh, there was an 18 month waiting period and people were okay with that people were willing to wait for 18 months because there was limited choice and the it was a more of a sellers market and now if you the example which i give is uh, you have seen those uh, camera rolls right like now nobody actually uses a camera roll for taking photographs um, typically you use a cell phone or if it is a digital the thing is the moment you click a photograph you how it will look you have an option of it editing it but those days it was just one roll you had to get all those 36 and there were no retakes and if something is spoiled it's spoiled and you were willing to wait for two weeks to get it developed in a color studio and a photo studio and then and we were okay with that because there were no options and kodak is a very classy example of what we used to do now coming back now we are world it's a very different world too much of uncertainty it's complex there's a lot of competition because if you don't do it somebody else will product life cycles have shortened because every day you see a new offering so things have become very very complex and challenging for everybody and at the end it's the consumer which has benefited now he is spoiled for choice and the example which i give is now you take a photograph you immediately put it on your social media because you don't want to wait because everybody wants instant gratification so you don't have the Uh, tolerance time you don't want to wait you are very very too anxious to do things real fast so that's why all this mad rush 
for a 30 minute delivery 15 minute delivery because the customer tolerance time has reduced drastically so that is what is driving all your because people typically say that supply chain starts from your supplier but understand supply chain always starts from your customer you can have an excellent product you can have an excellent service but if you don't have a customer everything falls flat so supply chain starts from your customer that's you have to understand it now the way this is a very textbookish definition that you will have a supplier or a producer or a distributor like okay, a typically manufacturing thing the products move downstream but understand that logically it may look like this but supply chain always starts from your customer that's very very critical and it's never linear it's multi directional it's exponential to the nth level it's always a web and we call it as a chain because your chain is as strong as the weakest link that's why we call it as a chain moving on if this is a typical thing from a unilever website so you know look at it now a lot of people said that countries had closed their borders we are trying to do it self sufficient but what i will say is because it makes more sense to produce in a place where you are the least cost producer and distribute in a place where you make the most money so if you look at this unilever website this is the kind of products they want to distribute all across the world manufactured in certain pockets of the world so that's where your supply chain is it's never linear it's exponential to the nth degree it's never unidirectional it's directional to the nth degree so because today's customers they don't just want to interact with your customer sales they interact with your manufacturing guys they interact with your procurement guys at every point if you talk about customer experience that's why there's a feedback loop which goes everywhere so understand that it's all about rapid product flow it's not about inventory it's not about storing because a lot of people believe that inventory is bad but understand that if you are talking about 30 minute delivery you will still need buffers because buffer has been actually people think that it's no no i cannot i should have zero inventory zero inventory jet is a myth because if you are doing a jet you are transferring your uh, risk to us, your suppliers and if i talk about supplier supplier is very much part of my supply chain so you are moving the risk to somebody else so if you are talking about a 30 minute 15 minute delivery you need to have buffers the problem is we have more of the bad inventory and less of the good inventory that is the precise reason that inventory is actually people think that oh inventory is bad inventory is not bad that's you need to have buffers but you have to time it you have to size it really well now this is how it looks like now, the point which i wanted to tell you is customer tolerance time has reduced drastically people are not willing to wait products have definitely become more complex and every customer is important so everybody wants a custom product they want importance they want to feel important so that's where i think uh, we are seeing all this changes people are talking about digital supply chain people are talking about faster delivery it's because of these changing dynamics which has and understand that forecast accuracy is now way way low now very classic example classic chicken and egg story your supply chain should it be efficient or responsive my efficient i mean you are a low cost producer so for example a soap or a paint or not a paint a soap or a shampoo you know what the customer so you are a low cost producer but if when i say responsiveness as every customer demands a custom product you try to respond to him and that means you are incurring higher cost but today supply chain have to be both now how do you do that you look at the power the classic thing which i have been reading for the last 10 15 years the power of postponement you have a standardized product but differentiate it very close to the customer for example asian paints in the 1990s if you visit any of these asian paints retail outlets if you ask for some color if they don't have it they will say that we will have to make it and give it to you that's a 3 to 6 months waiting period but today if you go to any of these retail outlets you ask for any color they will mix and match and give it to you so you are still an efficient supply chain but because you are differentiating it very close to the customer you are responsive so that's where you are looking at both responsiveness and efficiency so everybody is trying to do this so this is where the challenges so now do understand that 
why we are talking about now this is a typical example like you have a demand somewhere you have a supplier somewhere if your distribution center somewhere you have your customer somewhere now the only only way you can connect is using technology because it's very easy to say that i will outsource it's very easy to say that you will do it but outsourcing comes at a cost because you need better coordination you need better control because if something gets delayed your entire supply chain suffers any small hiccup it has a cascading effect and because today's supply chains are global in nature so that's why technology has become very very critical these days and thanks to rapid strides in technology all this is not feasible people technology existed but we did not no two technology could talk to each other so that is the precise reason that we are seeing uh, a lot of traction around this everybody is talking about digitalization because today we have technology which has enabled us now understand that what we spoke about it's all about adaptive supply chain supply chain has to completely adapt it has to align itself to the business goals because it cannot be in silos because the way you do your vision mission similarly supply chain also has to align with your business strategy it's very very critical very very important now let's look at how disruption and digitization has changed which has enabled us to do all this now first is technology always existed i told you but what has happened is your computing power has increased so much your storage has increased because i remember the first hard drive which i bought was something in megabytes bandwidth has exp- and the best part is now any two technology can talk to you because 1980s 90s integration was a big challenge people spent billions of dollars just integrating but today with open source today with cloud with rapid changes in technology today any technology can talk to any other technology that is the reason all this is we are seeing the light that this is possible in fact if you look at it 3d printing very very common these days 3d printing always existed but in 2016 there were three companies which went off patent so that's why it became affordable because today technology is affordable we are able to do this but to understand that it is still not affordable for small and medium enterprises it has to come down even further but having said that we have still made some good strides in this now if you look at the epic score model typically epic again uh, when i talk about supply chain body of knowledge i think they are the ultimate authority so typically they do a plan source make deliver but here what we have done is we have done the develop and the support model. in terms of develop what i wanted to talk about is if you see look at the pharma companies the drug discovery is always a very expensive and it's time consuming the last vaccine which came out it took 4 years but if you look at the covid vaccine it took about 8 to 9 months because we already had clinical data which could be integrated which could be and that's why we were able to do that similarly if you look at it uh, you use a lot of you spend a lot of time on social media um, and whatever you the moment you have a smartphone you have given your data to them the so people are analyzing your patterns and the moment you see that there are you get notifications that this is something very interesting for you then strategic sourcing nothing really uh, rocket science about it always existed now that only that we have better algorithms to tell us that if i do source it this way this and single supplier is a myth that covid had demonstrated because if you look at the india pharma company, uh, companies 70% of our apis the raw materials comes from china and the moment covid hit us what happened is our pharma production actually hit so that's why single supplier is always a myth you always need to have redundancy because redundancy is not bad you have to really get your business moving then in terms of as we work more remotely uh, smart glasses and all that have been able to we have been able to remotely support our offshore manufacturing that's very very critical uh, in terms of dynamic or predictive routing uh, this is nothing rock if you rocket science only thing we have better algorithms because if you look at an uber or an ola you will see that which route is congested so it suggests an alternate route and of course ar vr we are seeing big strides uh, it's just not for gaming for maintenance activity it's like a telemedicine where you sitting here you can do a surgery here so that's what as people tend to work from remote location but having said that not every industry has the luxury of working from home so that again we were very privileged who were able to work from home but having said that not everybody was equally privileged so do understand that some industries cannot work from home. 
Now, I just wanted to briefly touch upon Industry 4.0. Uh, if you look at it, the way it started, Industry 1.0, man tried to make his life easy. That's why steam engines came in. Then you had the World War happened, and then everything was destroyed. People looked at efficiency. That's where Industry 2.0 came in. Then 1970s, you saw business had grown too big. So it was not possible to do it using paper and pen. So that's where we started getting into uh, computer, but uh, digitization. But digitization and digitalization, there's a difference. Digitization, you are actually making it digital, but digitalization is where you are connecting. So 1970s, 2000, we were only digitizing stuff. The connectivity was still early because no two systems could talk to each other. That's why the ERPs were born. And now if you look at Industry 4.0, which is driving, it's all about connected devices. Your mobile is connected to uh, your, your laptop, your laptop is connected. So you get a notification everywhere, every time. So that's where, and all this is possible, is visible, because today we have technology which is actually driving all this. So that's why it's uh, has made big strides uh, in terms of our digital supply chain networks. Now, now this is a myth that because everybody is doing it, I should do it. No, you have to understand where you want to touch it because a lot of people think that because it always has an ROI, right? Because digitalization is expensive. You need to have a buy-in. You need to prove your ROI. So it's better not to do, do a big bang. You need to take some baby steps. And it's important to understand which is going to uh, give you a better return. For example, customer facing, that maybe is good for you. Similarly. If it's medical science, 3D printing helps. So similarly, if I say in terms of you're an asset heavy company, maybe you can look at a track and trace solution. So where you want to do, you have to really prioritize. Don't try to do everything together. It's, it's a recipe for failure. So that's very, very critical for us to understand. And uh, you must have heard this term digital twin again. Uh, it's a glorified thing. The typical thing is what we will look at is you have a physical world. You create a digital replica of the of that. Why do you do that? Because you have a problem, which is a business problem. You convert it to, to a mathematical problem. So that's your digital twin. And then you solve the mathematical problem and then you bring it back to your physical. Twin. So that's why I think the digital twin, uh, was, it's again, it's, it's, it's a hype. Uh, you don't have to really be very, very uh, jittery about that term. It's nothing but a replica of your physical world to because today we have AI, ML, which are actually driving all these algorithms. So that actually helps us a lot. Now let's look at some of the uh, real life, because what I spoke about is a theory right now. But uh, let's look at it. So Caterpillar, again, one of the biggest earth-moving equipments uh, manufacturers. So they have so many machines and all these need maintenance. If I have to monitor everything manually, it's not possible and it's expensive. So what they have done is they have sensors and the sensor actually collects data every day and you know that which needs maintenance. So again, it reduces idle time, it reduces the operator. Fit. So again, nothing rocket science about it, but a very uh, smart way of using technology. 3D printing, we spoke about it. There are parts which you will produce once in your life. Airline industry typically is like that because the lead time is pretty high and there, is, there are parts which you will produce once in your lifetime. So that's where I think, uh, in fact, artificial kidneys, artificial heart, they're using. In fact, uh, Fevicol, if you look at it, uh, they do a lot of this prototyping. Prototyping means you have to have a dye, you need to have a mold, and then you have to get a customer accept. All this takes time. So 3D printing, you actually do everything on a computer, you feed it to a stylus, and then it's, so they were able to save around 30 crores annually using this. So this is actually very promising technology. Uh, now this we spoke about the Asian paints example, but what Coke is experimenting is uh, they have these healthy drinks. You have a machine, you ask for any color, any flavor, they will mix and match and give it to you. So they have, again, it's a make to stock for them, but they have differentiating closer to the customer. So that's where I think the ultra delayed differentiation has been a very, very big uh, uh, breakthrough here. Now, this is where I marry uh, consumer behavior with supply chain, because typically if you study consumer behavior, UK, if there's a, it's a hot weather. People tend to actually consume a lot of ice creams, not so much in India. 
and that's why they were wasting all because they couldn't predict so what they have done is they have looked at the weather forecast they have based on the their algorithm which run which looks at that this is going to be a hot day and there's the notification which goes to our warehouse and factory that you start producing so tesco was able to save around 140 million dollars in terms of the, they knew it better so again this is where your marketing your sales your so supply chain everything is connected because never plan a business looking at only one function so that's a suboptimal planning so that's where in typically in any b school typically when a marketing case looks at only marketing angle but it's important to understand that any case it's always at an integrated angle so you need to look at all those things then again uh, we spoke about augmented reality easy jet they do the maintenance because maintenance is expensive personal are limited if they have to travel they cannot travel everywhere so using ar vr uh, easy jet has been able to maintain their aircraft so using remotely so very very popular these days uh, in terms of walmart uh, if i look at it uh, logistics optimization now any quality inspection it's a non value added activity because it doesn't help us so what happens is this drone like a drone has come in a big way so it starts taking photographs and wherever it compares with the master that is being checked manually so in india it may not be feasible right now because in india we don't have a problem of expensive uh, manpower but if you look at china now a typically cobot which is cheaper than a, a than a human being so the moment the technology costs come down we will see more of these coming in automation which is drive because whatever routine can be automated wherever there is a decision making i think you cannot really replace the human brain again in terms of sales optimization this is nothing uh, most of the fmcg companies have been doing it so the moment there is a point of sales data you uh, can actually uh, look at uh, all this uh, sensor driven replenishment so this is very very important now this is a very very classic example so the, the way i grew up uh, i grew up in a very small town so that's where uh, if i say uh, i we had a dairy farm where i could see the milk pure milk but then operation flood happened and then uh, what happened is uh, there was spurious milk now this company stony well they have given access that this is the cow being milk this is how the milk is coming to you so this is where i think you can uh, look at it uh, i think a ultimate experience in customer delight which we have seen now i leave it the uh, last slide so it's very important to look at uh, some of the trends because we will have more mega city that means you need to plan your logistics better because in india again the goods train passenger trains travel to the same railway line a very very infeasible option because that's why your goods train are uh, slower so that's where i think uh, you need to look at uh, planning your logistics better then i said that now every customer is going to be very very important um, so that's why we'll need see more segmentation that's why our supply chain also need to plan that way we have seen uh, uh, improved uh, supply chain infrastructure we will see better regulatory of course regulation we don't have any control but do understand that the moment the government announced uh, electric vehicles some of the industries went bust so you have to watch out for this and you can influence definitely we will have more stronger global connect and of course we have more affordable and accessible technology technology still has to come down so these are the trends which you need to really be mindful when you are looking at the next design so that's where i think uh, so this is what i'd had again thank you so much for your time and again for the privilege and honor uh, to be here so and again if there are any questions any comments i'll be more than happy to answer some of these it was a pleasure hearing from you sir and uh, i am pretty sure that the audience got some valuable insights on the topic supply chain 4.0 so we have a few questions uh, that were uh, asked i'll just direct them towards you mm mm-hmm. So the first question that was asked was, "What was the perception of industry 4.0 15 years ago, and what is it today? Can you please substantiate some examples with 
uh, which help the organization in transforming its operations to digital see uh, the point is uh, nobody really thought that any two technology could talk to each other so people were spending billions of dollars just integrating so i know people who have spent made lot of money just integrating technology so people never thought that we will come to this level but then there were rapid strides and today we know that with the open source with cloud any technology can talk to any so whenever you buy a new software the first thing which you look at is interoperability so that's where i think uh, it's very very positive and if you ask me 15 years down before people never even thought that it is even feasible okay tanya can take up the next question i think oh yes uh, thank you sir for sharing uh, such insightful data with us so uh, the next question we have with us is uh, does deloitte use any blockchain technology to increase the efficiency of any process internally we don't we have been advising clients blockchain again is a promising technology but only thing is because there are no universal standards and because of the things around cryptocurrency it is still not popular i, I see it as a very promising technology but uh, it is still a few years before we actually see because it has come in pharma but some companies are experimenting it some banks have experimented but it will take a while before we see real because they, there are no universal standards for that okay also you, i would like to ask one more question sir uh yeah so what is the future of industry 4.0 uh, can you share some examples which help the organization with some drastic changes see the point is now you get a notification right at 12 o'clock at night that your the goods have left the warehouse you will get a delivery tomorrow so it's not possible for me to put any manpower at 12 o'clock at night and your machines which are doing it secondly if you look at it all this remote working zoom and all that it all connected right we can't even think of a consulting business that we are not meeting face to face with the customer we will to do it right so it's all a mindset change and it works because consulting is a very high touch business but we were able to do it using high tech and high touch so that's again a very classic example how industry 4.0 has helped it's all about connected devices Tanya also has one more question i think so we have one more question for you uh, so which is more efficient mega city structure or thorough global urbanization <laughs> see urbanization is the problem is the farmer son doesn't want to become a farmer because he has aspiration right but i know people mom my friends five days they are software engineers two days they do farming the thing is people like us who want to go back to farming so i think a global urbanization is not the way because with the climate change and all that we have urbanized it too much because it's important that let's not even look at i think neither mega city or global urbanization let's not look at it let's develop the tier 2 tier 3 cities but don't uh, mess up too much with nature that we uh, because if you mess up with nature nature is going to hit us because now you have floods at all at odd hours you have deserts getting rainfall so so entire thing has changed so it's better i will say none of these is it you have to be mindful of respectful of the world that's very that's my answer all right okay. thank you i think we have one more question uh, so sir how does deloitte deal with efficiency versus resilience in the supply chain management uh, sector after the covid-19 pandemic era first is resilience come first because for, you are broken you have to come back so first you have to survive you have to be resilient so once you are resilient once you have got back then you can talk about efficiency so the first step what we say companies is you have a crisis first you survive the crisis so once you have survived it you start building upon it so we have a framework we have actually advised some of our clients on opening up after post covid so uh, some of these things i cannot share because of confidential reasons but uh, we, we have a structure in place we have a methodology in place but because resilience comes first and then comes efficiency because if i don't survive 
it's all it all falls flat thank you so much sir uh, this was indeed a very interesting address and i'm sure the audience got some very valuable insights on the topic supply chain 4.0 continuing with the theme of supply chain disruptions sandeep sir emphasized the importance of adaptive supply chains and digital supply networks industry 4.0 driven by a vast network of cyber physical systems is helping organizations to configure their supply chains to excel in competitive objectives thank you sir for helping us to learn the cutting edge chain concepts through real life examples as a token of thanks we would like to present you with a memento which will be delivered to you very soon thank you so much it was a pleasure and a privilege and thank you again once for having thank, thank you sir, you, sir. thank you now we would like to proceed to the release of momentum which is the official operations magazine of kdsmi institute of management a quarterly magazine momentum has readers across the world and has over 20000 views till now this quarter's publication is an international edition aligning with this year's global supply chain management conference with articles from usa canada and sweden published in it the theme for the current edition of momentum is digital supply chain so let us all proceed with the release of december 2021 international edition of momentum through this video and have a look at its content access this international edition of momentum kindly click on the link sent in the chat box with this we come to the end of our four minute session i request the presenters evaluators and our audience to reconvene post lunch at 2 pm the post lunch session will be held again on the zoom platform we'll begin with the paper presentations at 2 pm following which we will be having a round table conference where we will be seeing speakers from apple reliance industries epiroc and mahindra logistics discussing the topic intelligent supply chain so see you soon at the next session